Introduction to An Essay on Crimes and Punishments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn. An Essay on Crimes and Punishments by Cesare Beccaria. Translated by Edward Duncan Ingram. Introduction in every human society there is an effort continually tending to confer on one part the height of power and happiness and to reduce the other to the extreme of weakness and misery the intent of good laws is to oppose this effort and to diffuse their influence universally and equally but men generally abandoned the care of their most important concerns to the uncertain prudence and discretion of those whose interest it is to reject the best and wisest institutions and it is not till they have been led into a thousand mistakes in matters the most essential to their lives and liberties and are weary of suffering that they can be induced to apply a remedy to the evils with which they are oppressed it is then they begin to conceive and acknowledge the most palpable truths which from their very simplicity commonly escape vulgar minds incapable of analysing objects accustomed to receive impressions without distinction and to be determined rather by the opinions of others than by the result of their own examination if we look into history we shall find that laws which are or ought to be conventions between men in a state of freedom have been for the most part the work of the passions of a few or the consequences of a fortuitous or temporary necessity not dictated by a cool examiner of human nature who knew how to collect in one point the actions of a multitude and had this only end in view the greatest happiness of the greatest number happy are those few nations who have not waited till the slow succession of human vicissitudes should from the extremity of evil produce a transition to good but by prudent laws have facilitated the progress from one to the other and how great are the obligations due from mankind to that philosopher who from the obscurity of his closet had the courage to scatter among the multitude the seeds of useful truths so long unfruitful the art of printing has diffused the knowledge of those philosophical truths by which the relations between sovereigns and their subjects and between nations are discovered by this knowledge commerce is animated and there has sprung up a spirit of emulation and industry worthy of rational beings these are the produce of this enlightened age but the cruelty of punishments and the irregularity of proceedings in criminal cases so principal a part of the legislation and so much neglected throughout europe has hardly ever been called in question errors accumulated through many centuries have never yet been exposed by ascending to general principles nor has the force of acknowledged truths been ever opposed to the unbounded licentiousness of ill-directed power which has continually produced so many authorized examples of the most unfeeling barbarity surely the groans of the weak sacrificed to the cruel ignorance and indolence of the powerful the barbarous torments lavished and multiplied with useless severity for crimes either not proved or in their nature impossible the filth and horrors of a prison 
increased by the most cruel tormentor of the miserable uncertainty ought to have roused the attention of those whose business is to direct the opinions of mankind the immortal montesquieu has but slightly touched on this subject truth which is eternally the same has obliged me to follow the steps of that great man but the studious part of mankind for whom i write will easily distinguish the superstructure from the foundation i shall be happy if with him i can obtain the secret thanks of the obscure and peaceful disciples of reason and philosophy and excite that tender emotion in which sensible minds sympathize with him who pleads the cause of humanity end of the introduction preface by the translator of monsieur de voltaire's commentary of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn preface by the translator of monsieur de voltaire's commentary who the author of the translation of monsieur de voltaire's commentary upon the marquis beccaria's essay on crimes and punishments was i have never been able to ascertain but it has always been a matter of regret to me that it should have been suffered by its appearance in print to derogate from the reputation of the original it appears indeed at the first view to be a studied attempt to burlesque the style and misrepresent the sense of that celebrated writer these circumstances induce me upon the publication of a new edition of the essay to offer a new translation with the hope that though it be impossible to transfer to another language the spirit that characterizes the style of the original i might render m de voltaire intelligible to the american reader that this was not the case heretofore i need only appeal to those who have had the patience to read the version annexed to the first american edition of the essay on crimes and punishments the reasons are sufficiently obvious the translator appears to have been imperfectly acquainted with the french language and totally unacquainted with english or french law terms and proceedings a knowledge of which is absolutely necessary in order to avoid gross errors in translating a work in which legal phrases so frequently occur proper names also which the french generally alter to suit their own convenience appear to have caused him considerable embarrassment mark antonin being rendered mark anthony instead of marcus antonius and madame branvier is from the same cause metamorphosed into a man for some reason also all the notes and references by m de voltaire are omitted it may at the same time not be improper to remark that the translation being a literal one the style is uncouth to a degree of barbarism in consequence of the gallicism with which it abounds let it not be supposed however from my strictures upon another that i am anxious to attract attention to my own work or to deprecate criticism whatever pretensions i may have to notice are founded upon the belief that i have spared no pains to fulfil the first duty of a translator a faithful adherence to the sense of my author at the same time that i have endeavoured to do m de voltaire the justice to make him speak english how far i have succeeded in my object is not for me to judge nor shall i offer any apology for an attempt to render more intelligible any subject connected with the study 
or improvement of law convinced that to make any exertion with that view is to fulfil one of the first duties which every man owes to his profession philadelphia september nineteenth eighteen nineteen chapter one of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan and graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter one of the origin of punishments laws are the conditions under which men naturally independent united themselves in society weary of living in a continual state of war and of enjoying a liberty which became of little value from the uncertainty of its duration they sacrificed one part of it to enjoy the rest in peace and security the sum of all these portions of the liberty of each individual constituted the sovereignty of a nation and was deposited in the hands of the sovereign as the lawful administrator but it was not sufficient only to establish this deposit it was also necessary to defend it from the usurpation of each individual who will always endeavour to take away from the mass not only his own portion but to encroach on that of others some motives therefore that strike the senses were necessary to prevent the despotism of each individual from plunging society into its former chaos such motives are the punishments established against the infractors of the laws i say that motives of this kind are necessary because experience shows that the multitude adopt no established principle of conduct and because society is prevented from approaching to that dissolution to which as well as all other parts of the physical and moral world it naturally tends only by motives that are the immediate objects of sense and which being continually presented to the mind are sufficient to counterbalance the effects of the passions of the individual which oppose the general good neither the power of eloquence nor the sublimest truths are sufficient to restrain for any length of time those passions which are excited by the lively impressions of present objects End of chapter one chapter two of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingram this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter two of the right to punish every punishment which does not arise from absolute necessity says the great montesquieu is tyrannical a proposition which may be made more general thus every act of authority of one man over another for which there is not an absolute necessity is tyrannical it is upon this then that the sovereign's right to punish crimes is founded that is upon the necessity of defending the public liberty entrusted to his care from the usurpation of individuals and punishments are just in proportion as the liberty preserved by the sovereign is sacred and valuable let us consult the human heart and there we shall find the foundations of the sovereign's right to punish for no advantage in moral policy can be lasting which is not founded on the indelible sentiments of the heart of man whatever law deviates from this principle will always meet with a resistance which will destroy it in the end 
for the smallest force continually applied will overcome the most violent motion communicated to bodies no man ever gave up his liberty merely for the good of the public such a chimera exists only in romances every individual wishes if possible to be exempt from the compacts that bind the rest of mankind the multiplication of mankind though slow being too great for the means which the earth in its natural state offered to satisfy necessities which every day became more numerous obliged men to separate again and form new societies these naturally opposed the first and a state of war was transferred from individuals to nations thus it was necessity that forced men to give up a part of their liberty it is certain then that every individual would choose to put into the public stock the smallest portion possible as much only as was sufficient to engage others to defend it the aggregate of these the smallest portions possible forms the right of punishing all that extends beyond it is abuse not justice observe that by justice i understand nothing more than that bond which is necessary to keep the interests of individuals united without which men would return to their original state of barbarity all punishments which exceed the necessity of preserving this bond are in their nature unjust we should be cautious how we associate with the word justice an idea of anything real such as a physical power or a being that actually exists i do not by any means speak of the justice of god which is of another kind and refers immediately to rewards and punishments in a life to come End of chapter two chapter three of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter three consequences of the foregoing principles the laws only can determine the punishment of crimes and the authority of making penal laws can only reside with the legislator who represents the whole society united by the social compact no magistrate then as he is one of the society can with justice inflict on any other member of the same society punishment that is not ordained by the laws but as a punishment increased beyond the degree fixed by the law is the just punishment with the addition of another it follows that no magistrate even under a pretence of zeal or the public good should increase the punishment already determined by the laws if every individual be bound to society society is equally bound to him by a contract which from its nature equally binds both parties this obligation which descends from the throne to the cottage and equally binds the highest and lowest of mankind signifies nothing more than that it is the interest of all that conventions which are useful to the greatest number should be punctually observed the violation of this compact by any individual is an introduction to anarchy the sovereign who represents the society itself can only make general laws to bind the members but it belongs not to him to judge whether any individual has violated the social compact 
or incurred the punishment in consequence for in this case there are two parties one represented by the sovereign who insists upon the violation of the contract and the other is the person accused who denies it it is necessary then that there should be a third person to decide this contest that is to say a judge or magistrate from whose determination there should be no appeal and this determination should consist of a simple affirmation or negation of fact if it can only be proved that the severity of punishments though not immediately contrary to the public good or to the end for which they were intended videlicet to prevent crimes be useless then such severity would be contrary to those beneficent virtues which are the consequence of enlightened reason which instructs the sovereign to wish rather to govern men in a state of freedom and happiness than of slavery it would also be contrary to justice and the social compact End of chapter three Chapter four of an essay on crimes and punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan Ingraham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter four of the interpretation of laws. Judges in criminal cases have no right to interpret the penal laws because they are not legislators they have not received the laws from our ancestors as a domestic tradition or as the will of a testator which his heirs and executors are to obey but they receive them from a society actually existing or from the sovereign its representative even the authority of the laws is not founded on any pretended obligation or ancient convention which must be null as it cannot bind those who did not exist at the time of its institution and unjust as it would reduce men in the ages following to a herd of brutes without any power of judging or acting the laws receive their force and authority from an oath of fidelity either tacit or expressed which living subjects have sworn to their sovereign in order to restrain the intestine fermentation of the private interest of individuals from hence springs their true and natural authority who then is their lawful interpreter the sovereign that is the representative of society and not the judge whose office is only to examine if a man have or have not committed an action contrary to the laws in every criminal case the judge should reason syllogistically the major should be the general law the minor the conformity of the action or its opposition to the laws the conclusion liberty or punishment if the judge be obliged by the imperfection of the laws or chooses to make any other or more syllogisms than this it will be an introduction to uncertainty there is nothing more dangerous than the common axiom the spirit of the laws is to be considered to adopt it is to give way to the torrent of opinions this may seem a paradox to vulgar minds which are more strongly affected by the smallest disorder before their eyes than by the most pernicious though remote consequences produced by one false principle adopted by a nation our knowledge is in proportion to the number of our ideas the more complex these are the greater is the variety of positions in which they may be considered every man has his own particular point of view and at different times 
sees the same objects in very different lights the spirit of the laws will then be the result of the good or bad logic of the judge and this will depend on his good or bad digestion on the violence of his passions on the rank or condition of the accused or on his connections with the judge and on all those little circumstances which change the appearance of objects in the fluctuating mind of man hence we see the fate of a delinquent changed many times in passing through the different courts of judicature and his life and liberty victims to the false ideas or ill-humour of the judge who mistakes the vague result of his own confused reasoning for the just interpretation of the laws we see the same crimes punished in a different manner at different times in the same tribunals the consequence of not having consulted the constant and invariable voice of the laws but the erring instability of arbitrary interpretation the disorders that may arise from a rigorous observance of the letter of penal laws are not to be compared with those produced by the interpretation of them the first are temporary inconveniences which will oblige the legislature to correct the letter of the law the want of preciseness and uncertainty of which has occasioned these disorders and this will put a stop to the fatal liberty of explaining the source of arbitrary and venal declamations when the code of laws is once fixed it should be observed in the literal sense and nothing more is left to the judge than to determine whether an action be or be not conformable to the written law when the rule of right which ought to direct the actions of the philosopher as well as the ignorant is a matter of controversy not of fact the people are slaves to the magistrates the despotism of this multitude of tyrants is more insupportable the less the distance is between the oppressor and the oppressed more fatal than that of one for the tyranny of many is not to be shaken off but by having recourse to that of one alone it is more cruel as it meets with more opposition and the cruelty of a tyrant is not in proportion to his strength but to the obstacles that oppose him these are the means by which security of person and property is best obtained which is just as it is the purpose of uniting in society and it is useful as each person may calculate exactly the inconveniences attending every crime by these means subjects will acquire a spirit of independence and liberty however it may appear to those who dare to call the weakness of submitting blindly to their capricious and interested opinions by the sacred name of virtue these principles will displease those who have made it a rule with themselves to transmit to their inferiors the tyranny they suffer from their superiors i should have everything to fear if tyrants were to read my book but tyrants never read End of chapter four Chapter Five of An Essay on Crimes and Punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan Ingraham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Five, of the Obscurity of Laws. If the power of interpreting laws be an evil, obscurity in them must be another as the former is the consequence of the latter this evil will be still greater if the laws be written in a language unknown to the people who being ignorant of the consequences of their own actions 
become necessarily dependent on a few who are interpreters of the laws which instead of being public and general are thus rendered private and particular what must we think of mankind when we reflect that such is the established custom of the greatest part of our polished and enlightened europe crimes will be less frequent in proportion as the code of laws is more universally read and understood for there is no doubt but that the eloquence of the passions is greatly assisted by the ignorance and uncertainty of punishments hence it follows that without written laws no society will ever acquire a fixed form of government in which the power is vested in the whole and not in any part of the society and in which the laws are not to be altered but by the will of the whole nor corrupted by the force of private interest experience and reason show us that the probability of human traditions diminishes in proportion as they are distant from their sources how then can laws resist the inevitable force of time if there be not a lasting monument of the social compact hence we see the use of printing which alone makes the public and not a few individuals the guardians and defenders of the laws it is this art which by diffusing literature has gradually dissipated the gloomy spirit of cable and intrigue to this art it is owing that the atrocious crimes of our ancestors who were alternately slaves and tyrants are become less frequent those who are acquainted with the history of the two or three last centuries may observe how from the lap of luxury and effeminacy have sprung the most tender virtues humanity benevolence and toleration of human errors they may contemplate the effects of what was so improperly called ancient simplicity and good faith humanity groaning under implacable superstition the avarice and ambition of a few staining with human blood the thrones and palaces of kings secret treasons and public massacres every noble a tyrant over the people and the ministers of the gospel of christ bathing their hands in blood in the name of the god of all mercy we may talk as we please of the corruption and degeneracy of the present age but happily we see no such horrid examples of cruelty and oppression End of chapter five Chapter six of an essay on crimes and punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan Ingraham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter six of the proportion between crimes and punishments. It is not only the common interest of mankind that crimes should not be committed but that crimes of every kind should be less frequent in proportion to the evil they produce to society therefore the means made use of by the legislature to prevent crimes should be more powerful in proportion as they are destructive of the public safety and happiness and as the inducements to commit them are stronger therefore there ought to be a fixed proportion between crimes and punishments it is impossible to prevent entirely all the disorders which the passions of mankind cause in society these disorders increase in proportion to the number of people and the opposition of private interests if we consult history we shall find them increasing in every state with the extent of dominion in political arithmetic 
it is necessary to substitute a calculation of probabilities to mathematical exactness that force which continually impels us to our own private interest like gravity acts incessantly unless it meets with an obstacle to oppose it the effects of this force are the confused series of human actions punishments which i would call political obstacles prevent the fatal effects of private interests without destroying the impelling cause which is that sensibility inseparable from man the legislator acts in this case like a skilful architect who endeavours to counteract the force of gravity by combining the circumstances which may contribute to the strength of his edifice the necessity of uniting in society being granted together with the conventions which the opposite interests of individuals must necessarily require a scale of crimes may be formed of which the first degree should consist of those which immediately tend to the dissolution of society and the last of the smallest possible injustice done to a private member of that society between these extremes will be comprehended all actions contrary to the public good which are called criminal and which descend by insensible degrees decreasing from the highest to the lowest if mathematical calculation could be applied to the obscure and infinite combinations of human actions there might be a corresponding scale of punishments descending from the greatest to the least but it will be sufficient that the wise legislator mark the principal divisions without disturbing the order left to crimes of the first degree to be assigned punishments of the last if there were an exact and universal scale of crimes and punishments we should there have a common measure of the degree of liberty and slavery humanity and cruelty of different nations any action which is not comprehended in the above-mentioned scale will not be called a crime or punished as such except by those who have an interest in the denomination the uncertainty of the extreme points of this scale hath produced a system of morality which contradicts the laws a multitude of laws that contradict each other and many which expose the best men to the severest punishments rendering the ideas of vice and virtue vague and fluctuating and even their existence doubtful hence that fatal lethargy of political bodies which terminates in their destruction whoever reads with a philosophic eye the history of nations and their laws will generally find that the ideas of virtue and vice of a good or a bad citizen change with the revolution of ages not in proportion to the alteration of circumstances and consequently conformable to the common good but in proportion to the passions and errors by which the different lawgivers were successively influenced he will frequently observe that the passions and vices of one age are the foundation of the morality of the following that violent passion the offspring of fanaticism and enthusiasm being weakened by time which reduces all the phenomena of the natural and moral world to inequality become by degrees the prudence of the age and a useful instrument in the hands of the powerful or artful politician hence the uncertainty of our notions of honour and virtue an uncertainty which will ever remain because they change with the revolutions of time and names survive the things they originally signified they change with the boundaries of states 
which are often the same both in physical and moral geography pleasure and pain are the only springs of actions in beings endowed with sensibility even amongst the motives which incite men to acts of religion the invisible legislator has ordained rewards and punishments from a partial distribution of these will arise that contradiction so little observed because so common i mean that of punishing by the laws the crimes which the laws have occasioned if an equal punishment be ordained for two crimes that injure society in different degrees there is nothing to deter men from committing the greater as often as it is attended with greater advantage End of chapter six chapter seven of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter seven of estimating the degree of crimes the foregoing reflections authorize me to assert that crimes are only to be measured by the injury done to society they err therefore who imagine that a crime is greater or less according to the intention of the person by whom it is committed for this will depend on the actual impression of objects on the senses and on the previous disposition of the mind both which will vary in different persons and even in the same person at different times according to the succession of ideas passions and circumstances upon that system it would be necessary to form not only a particular code for every individual but a new penal law for every crime men often with the best intention do the greatest injury to society and with the worst do it the most essential services others have estimated crimes rather by the dignity of the person offended than by their consequences to society if this were the true standard the smallest irreverence to the divine being ought to be punished with infinitely more severity than the assassination of a monarch in short others have imagined that the greatness of the sin should aggravate the crime but the fallacy of this opinion will appear on the slightest consideration of the relations between man and man and between god and man the relations between man and man are relations of equality necessity alone hath produced from the opposition of private passions and interests the idea of public utility which is the foundation of human justice the other are relations of dependence between an imperfect creature and his creator the most perfect of beings who has reserved to himself the sole right of being both lawgiver and judge for he alone can without injustice be at the same time both the one and the other if he hath decreed eternal punishments for those who disobey his will shall an insect dare to put himself in the place of divine justice or pretend to punish for the almighty who is himself all-sufficient who cannot receive impressions of pleasure or pain and who alone of all other beings acts without being acted upon the degree of sin depends on the malignity of the heart which is impenetrable to finite beings how then can the degree of sin serve as a standard to determine the degree of crimes if that were admitted men may punish when god pardons and pardon when god condemns and thus act in opposition to the supreme being
End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of an Essay on Crimes and Punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan Ingraham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Eight, of the Division of Crimes. We have proved then that crimes are to be estimated by the injury done to society this is one of those palpable truths which though evident to the meanest capacity yet by a combination of circumstances are only known to a few thinking men in every nation and in every age but opinions worthy only of the despotism of asia and passions armed with power and authority have generally by insensible and sometimes by violent impressions on the timid credulity of men effaced those simple ideas which perhaps constituted the first philosophy of an infant society happily the philosophy of the present enlightened age seems again to conduct us to the same principles and with that degree of certainty which is obtained by a rational examination and repeated experience a scrupulous adherence to order would require that we should now examine and distinguish the different species of crimes and the modes of punishment but they are so variable in their nature from the different circumstances of ages and countries that the detail would be tiresome and endless it will be sufficient for my purpose to point out the most general principles and the most common and dangerous errors in order to undeceive as well those who from a mistaken zeal for liberty would introduce anarchy and confusion as those who pretend to reduce society in general to the regularity of a covenant some crimes are immediately destructive of society or its representative others attack the private security of the life property or honour of individuals and a third class consists of such actions as are contrary to the laws which relate to the general good of the community the first which are of the highest degree as they are most destructive of society are called crimes of lese majesty high treason tyranny and ignorance which have confounded the clearest terms and ideas have given this appellation to crimes of a different nature and consequently have established the same punishment for each and on this occasion as on a thousand others men have been sacrificed victims to a word every crime even of the most private nature injures society but every crime does not threaten its immediate destruction moral as well as physical actions have their sphere of activity differently circumscribed like all the movements of nature by time and space it is therefore a sophistical interpretation the common philosophy of slaves that would confound the limits of things established by eternal truth to these succeed crimes which are destructive of the security of individuals this security being the principal end of all society and to which every citizen hath an undoubted right it becomes indispensably necessary that to these crimes the greatest of punishments should be assigned the opinion that every member of society has a right to do anything that is not contrary to the laws 
without fearing any other inconveniences than those which are the natural consequences of the action itself is a political dogma which should be defended by the laws inculated by the magistrates and believed by the people a sacred dogma without which there can be no lawful society a just recompense for our sacrifice of that universal liberty of action common to all sensible beings and only limited by our natural powers by this principle our minds become free active and vigorous by this alone we are inspired with that virtue which knows no fear so different from that pliant prudence worthy of those only who can bear a precarious existence attempts therefore against the life and liberty of a citizen are crimes of the highest nature under this head we comprehend not only assassinations and robberies committed by the populace but by grandees and magistrates whose example acts with more force and at a greater distance destroying the ideas of justice and duty among the subjects and substituting that of the right of the strongest equally dangerous to those who exercise it and to those who suffer End of chapter eight chapter nine of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter nine of honour there is a remarkable difference between the civil laws those jealous guardians of life and property and the laws of what is called honour which particularly respects the opinion of others honour is a term which has been the foundation of many long and brilliant reasonings without annexing to it any precise or fixed idea how miserable is the condition of the human mind to which the most distant and least essential matters the revolutions of the heavenly bodies are more distinctly known than the most interesting truths of morality which are always confused and fluctuating as they happen to be driven by the gales of passion or received and transmitted by ignorance but this will cease to appear strange if it be considered that as objects when too near the eye appear confused so the too great vicinity of the ideas of morality is the reason why the simple ideas of which they are composed are easily confounded but which must be separated before we can investigate the phenomena of human sensibility and the intelligent observer of human nature will cease to be surprised that so many ties and such an apparatus of morality are necessary to the security and happiness of mankind honour then is one of those complex ideas which are an aggregate not only of simple ones but others so complicated that in their various modes of affecting the human mind they sometimes admit and sometimes exclude part of the elements of which they are composed retaining only some few of the most common as many algebraic quantities admit one common divisor to find this common divisor of the different ideas attached to the word honour it will be necessary to go back to the original formation of society the first laws and the first magistrates owed their existence to the necessity of preventing the disorders 
which the natural despotism of individuals would unavoidably produce this was the object of the establishment of society and was either in reality or in appearance the principal design of all codes of laws even the most pernicious but the more intimate connections of men and the progress of their knowledge gave rise to an infinite number of necessities and mutual acts of friendship between the members of society these necessities were not foreseen by the laws and could not be satisfied by the actual power of each individual at this epocha began to be established the despotism of opinion as being the only means of obtaining those benefits which the law could not procure and of removing those evils against which the laws were no security it is opinion that tormentor of the wise and the ignorant that has exalted the appearance of virtue above virtue itself hence the esteem of men becomes not only useful but necessary to every one to prevent his sinking below the common level the ambitious man grasps at it as being necessary to his designs the vain man sues for it as a testimony of his merit the honest man demands it as his due and most men consider it as necessary to their existence honour being produced after the formation of society could not be a part of the common deposit and therefore whilst we act under its influence we return for that instance to a state of nature and withdraw ourselves from the laws which in this case are insufficient for our protection hence it follows in extreme political liberty and in absolute despotism all ideas of honour disappear or are confounded with others in the first case reputation becomes useless from the despotism of the laws and in the second the despotism of one man annulling all civil existence reduces the rest to a precarious and temporary personality honour then is one of the fundamental principles of those monarchies which are a limited despotism and in these like revolutions in despotic states it is a momentary return to the state of nature and original equality End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of An Essay on Crimes and Punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan Ingraham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Ten of Dueling. From the necessity of the esteem of others have arisen single combats and they have been established by the anarchy of the laws they are thought to have been unknown to the ancients perhaps because they did not assemble in their temples in their theatres or with their friends suspiciously armed with swords and perhaps because single combats were a common spectacle exhibited to the people by gladiators who were slaves and whom free men disdained to imitate in vain have the laws endeavoured to abolish this custom by punishing the offenders with death a man of honour deprived of the esteem of others foresees that he must be reduced either to a solitary existence insupportable to a social creature or become the object of perpetual insult 
considerations sufficient to overcome the fear of death what is the reason that duels are not so frequent among the common people as amongst the great not only because they do not wear swords but because to men of that class reputation is of less importance than it is to those of a higher rank who commonly regard each other with distrust and jealousy it may not be without its use to repeat here what has been mentioned by other writers videlicet that the best method of preventing this crime is to punish the aggressor that is the person who gave occasion to the duel and to acquit him who without any fault on his side is obliged to defend that which is not sufficiently secured to him by the laws End of chapter ten chapter eleven of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter eleven of crimes which disturb the public tranquillity another class of crimes are those which disturb the public tranquillity and the quiet of the citizens such as tumults and riots in the public streets which are intended for commerce and the passage of the inhabitants the discourses of fanatics which rouse the passions of the curious multitude and gain strength from the number of their hearers who though deaf to calm and solid reasoning are always affected by obscure and mysterious enthusiasm the illumination of the streets during the night at the public expense guards stationed in different quarters of the city the plain and moral discourses of religion reserved for the silence and tranquillity of churches and protected by authority and harangues in support of the interest of the public delivered only at the general meetings of the nation in parliament or where the sovereign resides are all means to prevent the dangerous effects of the misguided passions of the people these should be the principal objects of the vigilance of a magistrate and which the french call police but if this magistrate should act in an arbitrary manner and not in conformity to the code of laws which ought to be in the hands of every member of the community he opens a door to tyranny which always surrounds the conflicts of political liberty i do not know of any exception to this general axiom that every member of society should know when he is criminal and when innocent if censors and in general arbitrary magistrates be necessary in any government it produces from some fault in the constitution the uncertainty of crimes hath sacrificed more victims to secret tyranny than have ever suffered by public and solemn cruelty what are in general the proper punishments for crimes is the punishment of death really useful or necessary for the safety or good order of society are tortures and torments consistent with justice or do they answer the end proposed by the laws which is the best method of preventing crimes are the same punishments equally useful at all times what influence have they on manners these problems should be solved with that geometrical precision which the mist of sophistry the seduction of eloquence and the timidity of doubt are unable to resist 
if i have no other merit than that of having first presented to my country with a greater degree of evidence what other nations have written and are beginning to practise i shall account myself fortunate but if by supporting the rights of mankind and of invincible truth i shall contribute to save from the agonies of death one unfortunate victim of tyranny or of ignorance equally fatal his blessing and tears of transport will be a sufficient consolation to me for the contempt of all mankind End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter twelve of the intent of punishments from the foregoing considerations it is evident that the intent of punishments is not to torment a sensible being nor to undo a crime already committed it is possible that torments and useless cruelty the instrument of furious fanaticism or the impotency of tyrants can be authorized by a political body which so far from being influenced by passion should be the cool moderator of the passions of individuals can the groans of a tortured wretch recall the time past or reverse the crime he has committed the end of punishments therefore is no other than to prevent the criminal from doing further injury to society and to prevent others from committing the like offence such punishments therefore and such a mode of inflicting them ought to be chosen as will make the strongest and most lasting impressions on the minds of others with the least torment to the body of the criminal End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter thirteen of the credibility of witnesses to determine exactly the credibility of a witness and the force of evidence it is an important point in every good legislation every man of common sense that is every one whose ideas have some connection with each other and whose sensations are conformable to those of other men may be a witness but the credibility of his evidence will be in proportion as he is interested in declaring or concealing the truth hence it appears how frivolous is the reasoning of those who reject the testimony of women on account of their weakness how peril it is not to admit the evidence of those who are under sentence of death because they are dead in law and how irrational to exclude persons branded with infamy for in all cases they ought to be credited when they have no interest in giving false testimony the credibility of a witness then should only diminish in proportion to the hatred friendship or connections subsisting between him and the delinquent one witness is not sufficient for whilst the accused denies what the other affirms truth remains suspended and the right that every one has to be believed innocent turns the balance in his favour the credibility of a witness is the less as the atrociousness of the crime is greater from the improbability of its having been committed as in cases of witchcraft 
and acts of wanton cruelty the writers on penal laws have adopted a contrary principle videlicet that the credibility of a witness is greater as the crime is more atrocious behold their inhuman maxim dictated by the most cruel imbecility in atrocissimis leviores conjectura sufficiunt et licit judici jura transgredi let us translate this sentence that mankind may see one of the many unreasonable principles to which they are ignorantly subject in the most atrocious crimes the slightest conjectures are sufficient and the judge is allowed to exceed the limits of the law the absurd practices of legislators are often the effect of timidity which is a principal source of the contradictions of mankind the legislators or rather lawyers whose opinions when alive were interested and venal but which after their death become a decisive authority and are the sovereign arbiters of the lives and fortunes of men terrified by the condemnation of some innocent person have burdened the law with pompous and useless formalities the scrupulous observance of which will place anarchical impunity on the throne of justice at other times perplexed by the atrocious crimes of difficult proof they imagined themselves under a necessity of superseding the very formalities established by themselves and thus at one time with despotic impatience and at another with feminine timidity they transform their solemn judgments into a game of hazard but to return in the case of witchcraft it is much more probable that a number of men should be deceived than that any person should exercise a power which god hath refused to every created being in like manner in cases of wanton cruelty the presumption is always against the accuser for no man is cruel without some interest without some motive of fear or hate there are no spontaneous or superfluous sentiments in the heart of man they are all the result of impressions on the senses the credibility of a witness may also be diminished by his being a member of a private society whose customs and principles of conduct are either not known or are different from those of the public such a man has not only his own passions but those of the society of which he is a member finally the credibility of a witness is null when the question relates to the words of a criminal for the tone of voice the gesture all that precedes accompanies and follows the different ideas which men annex to the same words may so alter and modify a man's discourse that it is almost impossible to repeat them precisely in the manner in which they were spoken besides violent and uncommon actions such as real crimes leave a trace in the multitude of circumstances that attend them and in their effects but words remain only in the memory of the hearers who are commonly negligent or prejudiced it is infinitely easier then to found an accusation on the words than on the actions of a man for in these the number of circumstances urged against the accused affords him variety of means of justification End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria 
translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter fourteen of evidence and the proofs of a crime and of the form of judgment the following general theorem is of great use in determining the certainty of a fact when the proofs of a crime are dependent on each other that is when the evidence of each witness taken separately proves nothing or when all the proofs are dependent upon one the number of proofs either increase or diminish the probability of the fact for the force of the whole is no greater than the force of that on which they depend and if this fails they all fall to the ground when the proofs are independent on each other the probability of the fact increases in proportion to the number of proofs for the falsehood of the one does not diminish the veracity of another it may seem extraordinary that i speak of probability with regard to crimes which to deserve a punishment must be certain but this paradox will vanish when it is considered that strictly speaking moral certainty is only probability but which is called a certainty because every man in his senses assents to it from a habit produced by the necessity of acting and which is anterior to all speculation that certainty which is necessary to decide that the accused is guilty is the very same which determines every man in the most important transactions of his life the proofs of a crime may be divided into two classes perfect and imperfect i call those perfect which exclude the possibility of innocence imperfect those which do not exclude this possibility of the first one only is sufficient for condemnation of the second as many are required as form a perfect proof that is to say that though each of these separately taken does not exclude the possibility of innocence it is nevertheless excluded by their union it should also be observed that the imperfect proofs of which the accused if innocent might clear himself and does not become perfect but it is much easier to feel this moral certainty of proofs than to define it exactly for this reason i think it an excellent law which establishes assistance to the principal judge and those chosen by lot for that ignorance which judges by its feelings is less subject to error than the knowledge or the laws which judges by opinion where the laws are clear and precise the office of the judge is merely to ascertain the fact if in examining the proofs of a crime acuteness and dexterity be required if clearness and precision be necessary in summoning up the result to judge of the result itself nothing is wanting but plain and ordinary good sense a less fallacious guide than the knowledge of a judge accustomed to find guilty and to reduce all things to an artificial system borrowed from his studies happy the nation where the knowledge of the law is not a science it is an admirable law which ordains that every man shall be tried by his peers for when life liberty and fortune are in question the sentiments which a difference of rank and fortune inspires should be silent 
that superiority with which the fortunate look upon the unfortunate and that envy with which the inferior regard their superiors should have no influence but when the crime is an offence against a fellow-subject one half of the judges should be peers to the accused and the other peers to the person offended so that all private interest which in spite of ourselves modifies the appearance of objects even in the eyes of the most equitable is counteracted and nothing remains to turn aside the direction of truth and the laws it is also just that the accused should have the liberty of excluding a certain number of his judges where his liberty is enjoyed for a long time without any instance to the contrary the criminal seems to condemn himself all trials should be public that opinion which is the best or perhaps the only cement of society may curb the authority of the powerful and the passions of the judge and that the people may say we are protected by the laws we are not slaves a sentiment which inspires courage and which is the best tribute to a sovereign who knows his real interest i shall not enter into particulars there may be some persons who expect that i should say all that can be said upon this subject to such what i have already written must be unintelligible End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter fifteen of secret accusations secret accusations are a manifest abuse but consecrated by custom in many nations where from the weakness of the government they are necessary this custom makes men false and treacherous whoever suspects another to be an informer beholds in him an enemy and from thence mankind are accustomed to disguise their real sentiments and from the habit of concealing them from others they at last even hide them from themselves unhappy are those who have arrived at this point without any certain and fixed principles to guide them they fluctuate in the vast sea of opinion and are busied only in escaping the monsters which surround them to those the present is always embittered by the uncertainty of the future deprived of the pleasures of tranquillity and security some fleeting moments of happiness scattered thinly through their wretched lives console them for the misery of existing shall we amongst such men find intrepid soldiers to defend their king and country amongst such men shall we find incorruptible magistrates who with the spirit of freedom and patriotic eloquence will support and explain the true interest of their sovereign who with the tributes offer up at the throne of love and blessing of the people and thus bestow on the palaces of the great and the humble cottage peace and security and to the industrious a prospect of bettering their lot that useful ferment and vital principle of states who can defend himself from calumny armed with that impenetrable shield of tyranny secrecy what a miserable government must that be where the sovereign suspects an enemy in every subject and 
to secure the tranquillity of the public is obliged to sacrifice the repose of every individual by what argument is it pretended that secret accusations may be justified the public safety say they and the security and maintenance of the established form of government but what a strange constitution is that where the government which hath in its favour not only power but opinion still more efficacious yet fears its own subjects the indemnity of the informer do not the laws defend him sufficiently and are the subjects more powerful than the laws the necessity of protecting the informer from infamy then secret calumny is authorized and punished only when public the nature of the crime if actions indifferent in themselves or even useful to the public were called crimes both the accusation and the trial could never be too secret but can there be any crime committed against the public which ought not to be publicly punished i respect all governments and i speak not of any one in particular such may sometimes be the nature of circumstances that when the abuses are inherent in the constitution it may be imagined that to rectify them would be to destroy the constitution itself but were i to dictate new laws in a remote corner of the universe the good of posterity ever present to my mind would hold back my trembling hand and prevent me from authorizing secret accusations public accusations says montesquieu are more conformable to the nature of a republic where zeal for the public good is the principal passion of a citizen than of a monarchy in which as this sentiment is very feeble from the nature of the government the best establishment is that of commissioners who in the name of the public accuse the infractors of the laws but in all governments as well in a republic as in a monarchy the punishment due to the crime of which one accuses another ought to be inflicted on the informer End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter sixteen of torture the torture of a criminal during the course of his trial is a cruelty consecrated by custom in most nations it is used with an intent either to make him confess his crime or to explain some contradictions into which he had been led during his examination or discover his accomplices or for some kind of metaphysical and incomprehensible purgation of infamy or finally in order to discover other crimes of which he is not accused but of which he may be guilty no man can be judged a criminal until he be found guilty nor can society take from him the public protection until it have been found that he has violated the conditions on which it was granted what right then but that of power can authorize the punishment of a citizen so long as there remains any doubt of his guilt the dilemma is frequent either he is guilty or not guilty if guilty he should only suffer the punishment ordained by the laws and torture becomes useless as his confession is unnecessary 
if he be not guilty you torture the innocent for in the eye of the law every man is innocent whose crime has not been proved besides it is confounding all relations to expect that a man should be both the accuser and accused and that pain should be the test of truth as if truth resided in the muscles and fibres of a wretch in torture by this method the robust will escape and the feeble be condemned these are the inconveniencies of this pretended test of truth worthy only of a cannibal and which the romans in many respects barbarous and whose savage virtue has been too much admired reserved for the slaves alone what is the political intention of punishments to terrify and be an example to others is this intention answered by thus privately torturing the guilty and the innocent it is doubtless of importance that no crime should remain unpunished but it is useless to make a public example of the author of a crime hid in darkness a crime already committed and for which there can be no remedy can only be punished by a political society with an intention that no hopes of impunity should induce others to commit the same if it be true that the number of those who from fear or virtue respect the laws is greater than of those by whom they are violated the risk of torturing an innocent person is greater as there is a greater probability that ceteris paribus an individual has observed than that he has infringed the laws there is another ridiculous motive for torture namely to purge a man from infamy ought such an abuse to be tolerated in the eighteenth century can pain which is a sensation have any connection with a moral sentiment a matter of opinion perhaps the rack may be considered as the refiner's furnace it is not difficult to trace this senseless law to its origin for an absurdity adopted by a whole nation must have some affinity with other ideas established and respected by the same nation this custom seems to be the offspring of religion by which mankind in all nations and in all ages are so generally influenced we are taught by our infallible church that those stains of sin contracted through human frailty and which have not deserved the eternal anger of the almighty are to be purged away in another life by an incomprehensible fire now infamy is a stain and if the punishments and fire of purgatory can take away all spiritual stains why should not the pain of torture take away those of a civil nature i imagine that the confession of a criminal which in some tribunals is required as being essential to his condemnation has a similar origin and has been taken from the mysterious tribunal of penitence where the confession of sins is a necessary part of the sacrament thus have men abused the unerring light of revelation and in the times of traceable ignorance having no other they naturally had recourse to it on every occasion making the most remote and absurd applications moreover infamy is a sentiment regulated neither by the laws nor by reason but entirely by opinion but torture renders the victim infamous and therefore cannot take infamy away 
another intention of torture is to oblige the supposed criminal to reconcile the contradictions into which he may have fallen during his examination as if the dread of punishment the uncertainty of his fate the solemnity of the court the majesty of the judge and the ignorance of the accused were not abundantly sufficient to account for contradictions which are so common to men even in a state of tranquillity and which must necessarily be multiplied by the perturbation of the mind of a man entirely engaged in the thoughts of saving himself from imminent danger this infamite test of truth is a remaining monument of that ancient and savage legislation in which trials by fire by boiling water or the uncertainty of combats were called judgments of god as if the links of that eternal chain whose beginning is in the breast of the first cause of all things could ever be disunited by the institutions of men the only difference between torture and trials by fire and boiling water is that the event of the first depends on the will of the accused and of the second on a fact entirely physical and external but this difference is apparent only not real a man on the rack in the convulsions of torture has it as little in his power to declare the truth as in former times to prevent without fraud the effects of fire or boiling water every act of the will is invariably in proportion to the force of the impressions on our senses the impression of pain then may increase to such a degree that occupying the mind entirely it will compel the sufferer to use the shortest method of freeing himself from torment his answer therefore will be an effect as necessary as that of fire or boiling water and he will accuse himself of crimes of which he is innocent so that the very means employed to distinguish the innocent from the guilty will most effectually destroy all difference between them it would be superfluous to confirm these reflections by examples of innocent persons who from the agony of torture have confessed themselves guilty innumerable instances may be found in all nations and in every age how amazing that mankind have always neglected to draw the natural conclusion lives there a man who if he has carried his thoughts ever so little beyond the necessities of life when he reflects on such cruelty is not tempted to fly from society and return to his natural state of independence the result of torture then is a matter of calculation and depends on the constitution which differs in every individual and it is in proportion to his strength and sensibility so that to discover truth by this method is a problem which may be better solved by a mathematician than by a judge and may be thus stated the force of the muscles and the sensibility of the nerves of an innocent person being given it is required to find the degree of pain necessary to make him confess himself guilty of a given crime the examination of the accused is intended to find out the truth but if this be discovered with so much difficulty in the air gesture and countenance of a man at ease how can it appear in a countenance distorted by the convulsions of torture every violent action destroys those small alterations in the features which sometimes disclose the sentiments of the heart 
these truths were known to the roman legislators amongst whom as i have already observed slaves only who were not considered as citizens were tortured they are known to the english a nation in which the progress of science superiority in commerce riches and power its natural consequences together with the numerous examples of virtue and courage leave no doubt of the excellence of its laws they have been acknowledged in sweden where torture has been abolished they are known to one of the wisest monarchs in europe who having seated philosophy on the throne by his beneficent legislation has made his subjects free though dependent on the laws the only freedom that reasonable men can desire in the present state of things in short torture has not been thought necessary in the laws of armies composed chiefly of the dregs of mankind where its use should seem most necessary strange phenomenon that a set of men hardened by slaughter and familiar with blood should teach humanity to the sons of peace it appears also that these truths were known though imperfectly even to those by whom torture has been most frequently practised for a confession made during torture is null if it be not afterwards confirmed by an oath which if the criminal refuses he is tortured again some civilians and some nations permit this infamous petitio principi to be only three times repeated and others leave it to the discretion of the judge therefore of two men equally innocent or equally guilty the most robust and resolute will be acquitted and the weakest and most pusillanimous will be condemned in consequence of the following excellent mode of reasoning i the judge must find some one guilty thou who art a strong fellow hast been able to resist the force of torment therefore i acquit thee thou being weaker hast yielded to it i therefore condemn thee i am sensible that the confession which was extorted from thee has no weight but if thou dost not confirm by oath what thou hast already confessed i will have thee tormented again a very strange but necessary consequence of the use of torture is that the case of the innocent is worse than that of the guilty with regard to the first either he confesses the crime which he has not committed and is condemned or he is acquitted and has suffered a punishment he did not deserve on the contrary the person who is really guilty has the most favourable side of the question for if he supports the torture with firmness and resolution he is acquitted and has gained having exchanged a greater punishment for a less the law by which torture is authorized says men be insensible to pain nature has indeed given you an irresistible self-love and an unalienable right of self-preservation but i create in you a contrary sentiment a heroical hatred of yourselves i command you to accuse yourselves and to declare the truth amidst the tearing of your flesh and the dislocation of your bones torture is used to discover whether the criminal be guilty of other crimes besides those of which he is accused which is equivalent to the following reasoning thou art guilty of one crime therefore it is possible that thou mayest have committed a thousand others 
but the affair being doubtful i must try it by my criterion of truth the laws order thee to be tormented because thou art guilty because thou mayest be guilty and because i choose thou shouldst be guilty torches used to make the criminal discover his accomplices but if it has been demonstrated that it is not a proper means of discovering truth how can it serve to discover the accomplices which is one of the truths required will not the man who accuses himself yet more readily accuse others besides is it just to torment one man of the crime of another may not the accomplices be found out by the examination of the witnesses or of the criminal from the evidence or from the nature of the crime itself in short by all the means that have been used to prove the guilt of the prisoner the accomplices commonly fly when their comrade is taken the uncertainty of their fate condemns them to perpetual exile and frees society from the danger of further injury whilst the punishment of the criminal by deterring others answers the purpose for which it was ordained End of chapter sixteen Chapter seventeen of an essay on crimes and punishments by Cesare Beccaria translated by Edward Duncan Ingraham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter seventeen of Pecuniary Punishments there was a time when all punishments were pecuniary the crimes of the subjects were the inheritance of the prince an injury done to society was a favour to the crown and the sovereign and magistrates those guardians of the public security were interested in the violation of the laws crimes were tried at that time in a court of exchequer and the cause became a civil suit between the person accused and the crown the magistrate then had other powers than were necessary for the public welfare and the criminal suffered other punishments than the necessity of example required the judge was rather a collector for the crown an agent for the treasury than a protector and minister of the laws but according to this system for a man to confess himself guilty was to acknowledge himself a debtor to the crown which was and is at present the effects continuing after the causes have ceased the intent of all criminal causes thus the criminal who refuses to confess his crime though convicted by the most undoubted proofs will suffer a less punishment than if he had confessed and he will not be put to the torture to oblige him to confess other crimes which he might have committed as he has not confessed the principal but the confession being once obtained the judge becomes master of his body and torments him with a studied formality in order to squeeze out of him all the profit possible confession then is allowed to be a convincing proof especially when obtained by the force of torture at the same time that an extrajudicial confession when a man is at ease and under no apprehension is not sufficient for his condemnation all inquiries which may serve to clear up the fact but which may weaken the pretensions of the crown are excluded it was not from compassion to the criminal or from considerations of humanity that torments were sometimes spared 
but out of fear of losing those rights which at present appear chimerical and inconceivable the judge becomes an enemy to the accused to a wretch a prey to the horrors of a dungeon to torture to death and an uncertain futurity more terrible than all he inquires not into the truth of the fact but the nature of the crime he lays snares to make him convict himself he fears lest he should not succeed in finding him guilty and lest that infallibility which every man arrogates to himself should be called in question it is in the power of the magistrate to determine what evidence is sufficient to send a man to prison that he may be proved innocent he must first be supposed guilty this is what is called an offensive prosecution and such are all criminal proceedings in the eighteenth century in all parts of our polished europe the true prosecution for information that is an impartial inquiry into the fact that which reason prescribes which military laws adopt and which asiatic despotism allows in suits of one subject against another is very little practised in any courts of justice what a labyrinth of absurdities absurdities which will appear incredible to happier posterity the philosopher only will be able to read in the nature of man the possibility of there ever having been such a system End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter eighteen of oaths there is a palpable contradiction between the laws and the natural sentiments of mankind in the case of oaths which are administered to a criminal to make him speak the truth when the contrary is in his greatest interest as if a man could think himself obliged to contribute to his own destruction and as if when interest speaks religion was not generally silent religion which in all ages has of all other things been most commonly abused and indeed upon what motive should it be respected by the wicked when it has been thus violated by those who were esteemed by the wisest of men the motives which religion opposes to the fear of impending evil and the love of life are too weak as they are too distant to make any impression on the senses the affairs of the other world are regulated by laws entirely different from those by which human affairs are directed why then should you endeavour to compromise matters between them why should a man be reduced to the terrible alternative either of offending god or of contributing to his own immediate destruction the laws which require an oath in such a case leave him only the choice of becoming a bad christian or a martyr for this reason oaths become by degrees a mere formality and all sentiments of religion perhaps the only motive of honesty in the greatest part of mankind are destroyed experience proves their inutility i appeal to every judge whether he has ever known that an oath alone has brought truth from the lips of a criminal and reason tells us it must be so for all laws are useless and in consequence destructive which contradict the natural feelings of mankind such laws are like a dyke opposed directly to the course of a torrent 
it is either immediately overwhelmed or by a whirlpool formed by itself it is gradually undermined and destroyed End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter nineteen of the advantage of immediate punishment the more immediately after the commission of a crime a punishment is inflicted the more just and useful it will be it will be more just because it spares the criminal the cruel and superfluous torment of uncertainty which increases in proportion to the strength of his imagination and the sense of his weakness and because the privation of liberty being a punishment ought to be inflicted before condemnation but for as short a time as possible imprisonment i say being only the means of securing the person of the accused until he be tried condemned or acquitted ought not only be of as short duration but attended with as little severity as possible the time should be determined by the necessary preparation for the trial and the right of priority in the oldest prisoners the confinement ought not to be closer than is requisite to prevent his flight or his concealing the proofs of the crime and the trial should be conducted with all possible expedition can there be a more cruel contrast than that between the indolence of a judge and the painful anxiety of the accused the comforts and pleasures of an insensible magistrate and the filth and misery of the prisoner in general as i have before observed the degree of the punishment and the consequences of a crime ought to be so contrived as to have the greatest possible effect on others with the least possible pain to the delinquent if there be any society in which this is not a fundamental principle it is an unlawful society for mankind by their union originally intended to subject themselves to the least evils possible an immediate punishment is more useful because the smaller the interval of time between the punishment and the crime the stronger and more lasting will be the association of the two ideas of crime and punishment so that they may be considered one as the cause and the other as the unavoidable and necessary effect it is demonstrated that the association of ideas is the cement which unites the fabric of the human intellect without which pleasure and pain would be simple and ineffectual sensations the vulgar that is all men who have no general ideas or universal principles act in consequence of the most immediate and familiar associations but the more remote and complex only present themselves to the minds of those who are passionately attached to a single object or to those of greater understanding who have acquired a habit of rapidly comparing together a number of objects and of forming a conclusion and the result that is the action in consequence by these means becomes less dangerous and uncertain it is then 
of the greatest importance that the punishment should succeed the crime as immediately as possible if we intend that in the rude minds of the multitude the seducing picture of the advantage arising from the crime should instantly awake the attendant idea of punishment delaying the punishment serves only to separate these two ideas and thus affects the mind of the spectators rather as being a terrible sight than the necessary consequence of a crime the horror of which should contribute to heighten the idea of the punishment there is another excellent method of strengthening this important connection between the ideas of crime and punishment that is to make the punishment as analogous as possible to the nature of the crime in order that the punishment may lead the mind to consider the crime in a different point of view from that in which it was placed by the flattering idea of promised advantages crimes of less importance are commonly punished either in the obscurity of a prison or the criminal is transported to give by his slavery an example to societies which he never offended an example absolutely useless because distant from the place where the crime was committed men do not in general commit great crimes deliberately but rather in a sudden gust of passion and they commonly look on the punishment due to a great crime as remote and improbable the public punishment therefore of small crimes will make a greater impression and by deterring men from the smaller will effectually prevent the greater End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter twenty of acts of violence some crimes relate to person others to property the first ought to be punished corporally the great and rich should by no means have it in their power to set a price on the security of the weak and indigent for then riches which under the protection of the laws are the reward of industry would become the element of tyranny liberty is at an end whenever the laws permit that in certain cases a man may cease to be a person and become a thing then will the powerful employ their address to select from the various combinations of civil society all that is in their own favour this is that magic art which transforms subjects into beasts of burden and which in the hands of the strong is the chain that binds the weak and incautious thus it is that in some governments where there is all the appearance of liberty tyranny lies concealed and insinuates itself into some neglected corner of the constitution where it gathers strength insensibly mankind generally oppose with resolution the assaults of barefaced and open tyranny but disregard the little insect that gnaws through the dyke and opens a sure though secret passage to inundation End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria 
translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter twenty one of the punishment of the nobles what punishments shall be ordained for the nobles whose privileges make so great a part of the laws of nations i do not mean to inquire whether the hereditary distinction between nobles and commoners be useful in any government or necessary in a monarchy or whether it be true that they form an immediate power of use in moderating the excess of both extremes or whether they be not rather slaves to their own body and to others confining within a very small circle the natural effects and hopes of industry like those little fruitful spots scattered here and there in the sandy deserts of arabia or whether it be true that a subordination of rank and condition is inevitable or useful in society and if so whether this subordination should not rather subsist between individuals than particular bodies whether it should not rather circulate through the whole body politic than be confined to one part and rather than be perpetual should it not be incessantly produced and destroyed be these as they may i assert that the punishment of a nobleman should in no wise differ from that of the lowest member of society every lawful distinction either in honours or riches supposes previous equality founded on the laws on which all the members of society are considered as being equally dependent we should suppose that men in renouncing their natural despotism said the wisest and most industrious among us should obtain the greatest honours and his dignity shall descend to his posterity the fortunate and happy may hope for greater honours but let him not therefore be less afraid than others of violating those conditions on which he is exalted it is true indeed that no such degrees were ever made in a general diet of mankind but they exist in the invariable relations of things nor do they destroy the advantages which are supposed to be produced by the class of nobles but prevent the inconveniences and they make the laws respectable by destroying all hopes of impunity it may be objected that the same punishment inflicted on a nobleman and a plebeian becomes really different from the difference of their education and from the infamy it reflects on an illustrious family but i answer that punishments are to be estimated not by the sensibility of the criminal but by the injury done to society which injury is augmented by the high rank of the offender the precise equality of a punishment can never be more than external as it is in proportion to the degree of sensibility which differs in every individual the infamy of an innocent family may be easily obliterated by some public demonstration of favour from the sovereign and forms have always more influence than reason on the gazing multitude End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter twenty two of robbery 
the punishment of robbery not accompanied with violence should be pecuniary he who endeavours to enrich himself with the property of another should be deprived of part of his own but this crime alas is commonly the effect of misery and despair the crime of that unhappy part of mankind to whom the right of exclusive property a terrible and perhaps unnecessary right has left but a bare existence besides as pecuniary punishments may increase the number of robbers by increasing the number of poor and may deprive an innocent family of subsistence the most proper punishment will be that kind of slavery which alone can be called just that is which makes the society for a time absolute master of the person and labour of the criminal in order to oblige him to repair by his dependence the unjust despotism he usurped over the property of another and his violation of the social compact when robbery is attended with violence corporal punishment should be added to slavery many writers have shown the evident disorder which must arise from not distinguishing the punishment due to robbery with violence and that due to theft or robbery committed with dexterity absurdly making a sum of money equivalent to a man's life but it can never be superfluous to repeat again and again those truths of which mankind have not profited for political machines preserve their motion much longer than others and receive a new impulse with more difficulty these crimes are in their nature absolutely different and this axiom is as certain in politics as in mathematics that between qualities of different natures there can be no similitude End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of nessie on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter twenty three of infamy considered as a punishment those injuries which affect the honour that is that just portion of esteem which every citizen has a right to expect from others should be punished with infamy infamy is a mark of the public disapprobation which deprives the object of all consideration in the eyes of his fellow-citizens of the confidence of his country and of that fraternity which exists between members of the same society this is not always in the power of the laws it is necessary that the infamy inflicted by the laws should be the same with that which results from the relations of things from universal morality or from that particular system adopted by the nation and the laws which governs the opinion of the vulgar if on the contrary one be different from the other either the laws will no longer be respected or the received notions of morality and probity will vanish in spite of the declamations of moralists which are always too weak to resist the force of example if we declare those actions infamous which are in themselves indifferent we lessen the infamy of those which are really infamous 
the punishment of infamy should not be too frequent for the power of opinion grows weaker by repetition nor should it be inflicted on a number of persons at the same time for the infamy of many resolves itself into the infamy of none painful and corporal punishments should never be applied to fanaticism for being founded on pride infamy and ridicule only should be employed against fanatics if the first their pride will be overbalanced by the pride of the people and we may judge of the power of the second if we consider that even truth is obliged to summon all her force when attacked by error armed with ridicule thus by opposing one passion to another and opinion to opinion a wise legislator puts an end to the admiration of the populace occasioned by a false principle the original absurdity of which is veiled by some well-deduced consequences this is the method to avoid confounding the immutable relations of things or opposing nature whose actions not being limited by time but operating incessantly overturn and destroy all those vain regulations which contradict her laws it is not only in the fine arts that the imitation of nature is the fundamental principle it is the same in sound policy which is no other than the art of uniting and directing to the same end the natural and immutable sentiments of mankind End of chapter 23chapter twenty four of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter twenty four of idleness a wise government will not suffer in the midst of labour and industry that kind of political idleness which is confounded by rigid declaimers with the leisure attending riches acquired by industry which is of use to an increasing society when confined within proper limits i call those politically idle who neither contribute to the good of society by their labour nor their riches who continually accumulate but never spend who are reverenced by the vulgar with stupid admiration and regarded by the wise with disdain who being victims to a monastic life and deprived of all incitement to that activity which is necessary to preserve or increase its comforts devote all their vigour to passions of the strongest kind the passions of opinion i call not him idle who enjoys the fruits of the virtues or vices of his ancestors and in exchange for his pleasures supports the industrious poor it is not then the narrow virtue of austere moralists but the laws that should determine what species of idleness deserves punishment End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter twenty five of banishment and confiscation 
he who disturbs the public tranquillity who does not obey the laws who violates the conditions on which men mutually support and defend each other ought to be excluded from society that is banished it seems as if banishment should be the punishment of those who being accused of an atrocious crime are probably but not certainly guilty for this purpose would be required a law the least arbitrary and the most precise possible which should condemn to banishment those who have reduced the community to the fatal alternative either of fearing or punishing them unjustly still however leaving them the sacred right of proving their innocence the reasons ought to be stronger for banishing a citizen than a stranger and for the first accusation than for one who hath been often accused should the person who is excluded for ever from society be deprived of his property this question may be considered in different lights the confiscation of effects added to banishment is a greater punishment than banishment alone there ought then to be some cases in which according to the crime either the whole fortune should be confiscated or part only or none at all the whole should be forfeited when the law which ordains banishment declares at the same time that all connections or relations between the society and the criminal are annihilated in this case the citizen dies the man only remains and with respect to political body the death of the citizen should have the same consequences with the death of the man it seems to follow then that in this case the effects of the criminal should devolve to his lawful heirs but it is not on account of this refinement that i disapprove of confiscations if some have insisted that they were restrained to vengeance and the violence of particulars they have not reflected that though punishments be productive of good they are not on that account more just to be just they must be necessary even a useful injustice can never be allowed by a legislator who means to guard against watchful tyranny which under the flattering pretext of momentary advantages would establish permanent principles of destruction and to procure the ease of a few in a high station would draw tears from thousands of the poor the law which ordains confiscations sets a price on the head of the subject with the guilty punishes the innocent and by reducing them to indigence and despair tempts them to become criminal can there be a more melancholy spectacle than a whole family overwhelmed with infamy and misery from the crime of their chief a crime which if it had been possible they were restrained from preventing by that submission which the laws themselves have ordained End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter twenty six of the spirit of family in states it is remarkable that many fatal acts of injustice have been authorized and approved 
even by the wisest and most experienced men in the freest republics this has been owing to their having considered the state rather as a society of families than of men let us suppose a nation composed of a hundred thousand men divided into twenty thousand families of five persons each including the head or master of the family its representative if it be an association of families there will be twenty thousand men and eighty thousand slaves or if it of men there will be a hundred thousand citizens and not one slave in the first case we behold a republic and twenty thousand little monarchies of which the heads are the sovereigns in the second the spirit of liberty will not only breathe in every public place of the city and in the assemblies of the nation but in private houses where men find the greatest part of their happiness or misery as laws and customs are always the effect of the habitual sentiments of the members of a republic if the society be an association of the heads of families the spirit of monarchy will gradually make its way into the republic itself and its effects will only be restrained by the opposite interests of each and not by a universal spirit of liberty and equality the private spirit of family is a spirit of minuteness and confined to little concerns public spirit on the contrary is influenced by general principles and from facts deduces general rules of utility to the greatest number in a republic of families the children remain under the authority of the father as long as he lives and are obliged to wait until his death for an existence dependent on the laws alone accustomed to kneel and tremble in their tender years when their natural sentiments were less restrained by that caution obtained by experience which is called moderation how should they resist those obstacles which vice always opposes to virtue in the languor and decline of age when the despair of reaping the fruits is alone sufficient to damp the vigour of their resolutions in a republic where every man is a citizen family subordination is not the effect of compulsion but of contract and the sons disengaged from the natural dependence which the weakness of infancy and the necessity of education required become free members of society but remain subject to the head of the family for their own advantage as in the great society in a republic of families the young people that is the most numerous and most useful part of the nation are at the discretion of their fathers in a republic of men they are attached to their parents by no other obligation than that sacred and inviolable one of mutual assistance and of gratitude for the benefits they have received a sentiment destroyed not so much by the wickedness of the human heart as by a mistaken subjection prescribed by the laws these contradictions between the laws of families and the fundamental laws of a state are the source of many others between public and private morality which produce a perpetual conflict in the mind 
domestic morality inspires submission and fear the other courage and liberty that instructs a man to confine his beneficence to a small number of persons not of his own choice this to extend it to all mankind that commands a continual sacrifice of himself to a vain idol called the good of the family which is often no real good to any one but those who compose it this teaches him to consider his own advantage without offending the laws or excites him to sacrifice himself for the good of his country by rewarding him beforehand with the fanaticism it inspires such contradictions are the reason that men neglect the pursuit of virtue which they can hardly distinguish amidst the obscurity and confusion of natural and moral objects how frequently are men upon a retrospection of their actions astonished to find themselves dishonest in proportion to the increase of society each member becomes a smaller part of the whole and the republican spirit diminishes in the same proportion if neglected by the laws political societies like the human body have their limits circumscribed which they cannot exceed without disturbing their economy it seems as if the greatness of a state ought to be inversely as the sensibility and activity of the individuals if on the contrary population and activity increase in the same proportion the laws will with difficulty prevent the crimes arising from the good they have produced an overgrown republic can only be saved from despotism by subdividing into a number of confederate republics but how is this practicable by a despotic dictator who with the courage of Scylla, has as much genius for building up as that roman had for pulling down if he be an ambitious man his reward will be immortal glory if a philosopher the blessings of his fellow-citizens will sufficiently console him for the loss of authority though he should not be insensible to their ingratitude in proportion as the sentiments which unite us to the state grow weaker those which attach us to the objects which more immediately surround us grow stronger therefore in the most despotic government friendships are more durable and domestic virtues which are always of the lowest class are the most common or the only virtues existing hence it appears how confined have been the views of the greatest number of legislators End of chapter twenty six Chapter twenty seven of An Essay on Crimes and Punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan in Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter twenty seven of The Mildness of Punishments. The course of my ideas has carried me away from my subject, to the elucidation of which I now return crimes are more effectually prevented by the certainty than the severity of punishment hence in a magistrate the necessity of vigilance and in a judge of implacability which that it may become a useful virtue should be joined to a mild legislation the certainty of a small punishment will make a stronger impression than the fear of one more severe 
if attended with the hopes of escaping for it is the nature of mankind to be terrified at the approach of the smallest inevitable evil whilst hope the best gift of heaven has the power of dispelling the apprehension of a greater especially if supported by examples of impunity which weakness or avarice too frequently afford if punishments be very severe men are naturally led to the perpetuation of other crimes to avoid the punishment due to the first the countries and times most notorious for severity of punishments were always those in which the most bloody and inhuman actions and the most atrocious crimes were committed for the hand of the legislator and the assassin were directed by the same spirit of ferocity which on the throne dictated laws of iron to slaves and savages and in private instigated the subject to sacrifice one tyrant to make room for another in proportion as punishments become more cruel the minds of men as a fluid rises to the same height with that which surrounds it grow hardened and insensible and the force of the passions still continuing in the space of a hundred years the wheel terrifies no more than formerly the prison that a punishment may produce the effect required it is sufficient that the evil it occasions should exceed the good expected from the crime including in the calculation the certainty of the punishment and the privation of the expected advantage all severity beyond this is superfluous and therefore tyrannical men regulate their conduct by the repeated impression of evils they know and not by those with which they are unacquainted let us for example suppose two nations in one of which the greatest punishment is perpetual slavery and in the other the wheel i say that both will inspire the same degree of terror and that there can be no reasons for increasing the punishments of the first which are not equally valid for augmenting those of the second to more lasting and more ingenuous modes of tormenting and so on to the most exquisite refinements of a science too well known to tyrants there are yet two other consequences of cruel punishments which counteract the purpose of their institution which was to prevent crimes the first arises from the impossibility of establishing an exact proportion between the crime and punishment for though ingenuous cruelty hath greatly multiplied the variety of torments yet the human frame can suffer only to a certain degree beyond which it is impossible to proceed be the enormity of the crime ever so great the second consequence is impunity human nature is limited no less in evil than in good excessive barbarity can never be more than temporary it being impossible that it should be supported by a permanent system of legislation for if the laws be too cruel they must be altered or anarchy and impunity will succeed it is possible without shuddering with horror to read in history of the barbarous and useless torments that were coolly invented and executed by men who were called sages who does not tremble at the thoughts of thousands of wretches whom their misery either caused or tolerated by the laws which favoured the few and outraged the many had forced in despair to return to a state of nature or accused of impossible crimes 
the fabric of ignorance and superstition or guilty only of having been faithful to their own principles who i say can without horror think of their being torn to pieces with slow and studied barbarity by men endowed with the same passions and the same feelings a delightful spectacle to a fanatic multitude End of chapter 27chapter twenty eight of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan and graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter twenty eight of the punishment of death the useless profusion of punishments which has never made men better induces me to inquire whether the punishment of death be really just or useful in a well-governed state what right i ask have men to cut the throats of their fellow-creatures certainly not that on which the sovereignty and laws are founded the laws as i have said before are only the sum of the smallest portions of the private liberty of each individual and represent the general will which is the aggregate of that of each individual did any one ever give to others the right of taking away his life is it possible that in the smallest portions of the liberty of each sacrificed to the good of the public can be contained the greatest of all good life if it were so how shall it be reconciled to the maxim which tells us that a man has no right to kill himself which he certainly must have if he could give it away to another but the punishment of death is not authorized by any right for i have demonstrated that no such right exists it is therefore a war of a whole nation against a citizen whose destruction they consider as necessary or useful to the general good but if i can further demonstrate that it is neither necessary nor useful i shall have gained the cause of humanity the death of a citizen cannot be necessary but in one case when though deprived of his liberty he has such power and connections as may endanger the security of the nation when his existence may produce a dangerous revolution in the established form of government but even in this case it can only be necessary when a nation is on the verge of recovering or losing its liberty or in times of absolute anarchy when the disorders themselves hold the place of laws but in a reign of tranquillity in a form of government approved by the united wishes of the nation in a state well fortified from enemies without and supported by strength within and opinion perhaps more efficacious where all power is lodged in the hands of a true sovereign where riches can purchase pleasures and not authority there can be no necessity for taking away the life of a subject if the experience of all ages be not sufficient to prove that the punishment of death has never prevented determined men from injuring society if the example of the romans if twenty years reign of elizabeth empress of russia in which she gave the fathers of their country an example more illustrious than many conquests bought with blood if i say all this be not sufficient to persuade mankind who always suspect the voice of reason and who choose rather to be led by authority 
let us consult human nature in proof of my assertion it is not the intenseness of the pain that has the greatest effect on the mind but its continuance for our sensibility is more easily and more powerfully affected by weak but repeated impressions than by a violent but momentary impulse the power of habit is universal over every sensible being as it is by that we learn to speak to walk and to satisfy our necessities so the ideas of morality are stamped on our minds by repeated impressions the death of a criminal is a terrible but momentary spectacle and therefore a less efficacious method of deterring others than the continued example of a man deprived of his liberty condemned as a beast of burden to repair by his labour the injury he has done to society if i commit such a crime says the spectator to himself i shall be reduced to that miserable condition for the rest of my life a much more powerful preventive than the fear of death which men always behold in distant obscurity the terrors of death make so slight an impression that it has not force enough to withstand the forgetfulness natural to mankind even in the most essential things especially when assisted by the passions violent impressions surprise us but their effect is momentary they are fit to produce those revolutions which instantly transform a common man into a lacedaemonian or a persian but in a free and quiet government they ought to be rather frequent than strong the execution of a criminal is to the multitude a spectacle which in some excites compassion mixed with indignation these sentiments occupy the mind much more than the salutary terror which the laws endeavour to inspire but in the contemplation of continued suffering terror is the only or at least predominant sensation the severity of a punishment should be just sufficient to excite compassion in the spectators as it is intended more for them than for the criminal a punishment to be just should have only that degree of severity which is sufficient to deter others now there is no man who upon the least reflection would put in competition the total and perpetual loss of his liberty with the greatest advantages he could possibly obtain in consequence of a crime perpetual slavery then has in it all that is necessary to deter the most hardened and determined as much as the punishment of death i say it has more there are many who can look upon death with intrepidity and firmness some through fanaticism and others through vanity which attends us even to the grave others from a desperate resolution either to get rid of their misery or cease to live but fanaticism and vanity forsake the criminal in slavery in chains and fetters in an iron cage and despair seems rather the beginning than the end of their misery the mind by collecting itself and uniting all its force can for a moment repel assailing grief but its most vigorous efforts are insufficient to resist perpetual wretchedness in all nations where death is used as a punishment every example supposes a new crime committed whereas in perpetual slavery every criminal affords a frequent and lasting example 
and if it be necessary that men should often be witnesses of the power of the laws criminals should often be put to death but this supposes a frequency of crimes and from hence this punishment will cease to have its effect so that it must be useful and useless at the same time i shall be told that perpetual slavery is as painful a punishment as death and therefore as cruel i answer that if all the miserable moments in the life of a slave were collected into one point it would be a more cruel punishment than any other but these are scattered through his whole life whilst the pain of death exerts all its force in a moment there is also another advantage in the punishment of slavery which is that it is more terrible to the spectator than to the sufferer himself for the spectator considers the sum of all his wretched moments while the sufferer by the misery of the present is prevented from thinking of the future all evils are increased by the imagination and the sufferer finds resources and consolations of which the spectators are ignorant who judge by their own sensibility of what passes in a mind by habit grown callous to misfortune let us for a moment attend to the reasoning of a robber or assassin who is deterred from violating the laws by the gibbet or the wheel i am sensible that to develop the sentiments of one's own heart is an art which education only can teach but although a villain may not be able to give a clear account of his principles they nevertheless influence his conduct he reasons thus what are these laws that i am bound to respect which make so great a difference between me and the rich man he refuses me the farthing i ask of him and excuses himself by bidding me have recourse to labour with which he is unacquainted who made these laws the rich and the great who never deigned to visit the miserable hut of the poor who have never seen him dividing a piece of mouldy bread amidst the cries of his famished children and the tears of his wife let us break those ties fatal to the greatest part of mankind and only useful to a few indolent tyrants let us attack injustice at its source i will return to my natural state of independence i shall live free and happy on the fruits of my courage and industry a day of pain and repentance may come but it will be short and for an hour of grief i shall enjoy years of pleasure and liberty king of a small number as determined as myself i will correct the mistakes of fortune and i shall see those tyrants grow pale and tremble at the sight of him whom with insulting pride they would not suffer to rank with their dogs and horses religion then presents itself to the mind of this lawless villain and promising him almost a certainty of eternal happiness upon the easy terms of repentance contributes much to lessen the horror of the last scene of the tragedy but he who foresees that he must pass a great number of years even his whole life in pain and slavery a slave to those laws by which he was protected in sight of his fellow-citizens with whom he lives in freedom and society makes a useful comparison between those evils the uncertainty of his success and the shortness of the time in which he shall enjoy the fruits of his transgression the example of those wretches continually before his eyes 
makes a much greater impression on him than a punishment which instead of correcting makes him more obdurate the punishment of death is pernicious to society from the example of barbarity it affords if the passions or the necessity of war have taught men to shed the blood of their fellow-creatures the laws which are intended to moderate the ferocity of mankind should not increase it by examples of barbarity the more horrible as this punishment is usually attended with formal pageantry is it not absurd that the laws which detest and punish homicide should in order to prevent murder publicly commit murder themselves what are the true and most useful laws those compacts and conditions which all would propose and observe in those moments when private interest is silent or combined with that of the public what are the natural sentiments of every person concerning the punishment of death we may read them in the contempt and indignation with which every one looks on the executioner who is nevertheless an innocent executor of the public will a good citizen who contributes to the advantages of society the instrument of the general security within as good soldiers are without what then is the origin of this contradiction why is this sentiment of mankind indelible to the scandal of reason it is that in a secret corner of the mind in which the original impressions of nature are still preserved men discover a sentiment which tells them that their lives are not lawfully in the power of any one but of that necessity only which with its iron sceptre rules the universe what must men think when they see wise magistrates and grave ministers of justice with indifference and tranquillity dragging a criminal to death and whilst a wretch trembles with agony expecting the fatal stroke the judge who has condemned him with the coldest insensibility and perhaps with no small gratification from the exertion of his authority quits his tribunal to enjoy the comforts and pleasures of life they will say ah those cruel formalities of justice are a cloak to tyranny they are a secret language a solemn veil intended to conceal the sword by which we are sacrificed to the insatiable idol of despotism murder which they would represent to us a horrible crime we see practised by them without repugnance and remorse let us follow their example a violent death appeared terrible in their descriptions but we see that it is the affair of a moment it will be still less terrible to him who not expecting it escapes all the most all the pain such is the fatal though absurd reasonings of men who are disposed to commit crimes on whom the abuse of religion has more influence than religion itself if it be objected that almost all nations in all ages have punished certain crimes with death i answer that the force of these examples vanishes when opposed to truth against which prescription is urged in vain the history of mankind is an immense sea of errors in which a few obscure truths may here and there be found but human sacrifices have also been common in almost all nations that some societies only either few in number or for a very short time 
abstained from the punishment of death is rather favourable to my argument for such is the fate of great truths that their duration is only as a flash of lightning in the long and dark night of error the happy time is not yet arrived when truth as falsehood has been hitherto shall be the portion of the greatest number i am sensible that the voice of one philosopher is too weak to be heard amidst the clamours of a multitude blindly influenced by custom but there is a small number of sages scattered on the face of the earth who will echo to me from the bottom of their hearts and if these truths should happily force their way to the thrones of princes be it known to them that they come attended with the secret wishes of all mankind and tell the sovereign who deigns them a gracious reception that his fame shall outshine the glory of conquerors and that equitable posterity will exalt his peaceful trophies above those of a titus an antonius or a Fryan. how happy were mankind if laws were now to be first formed now that we see on the thrones of europe benevolent monarchs friends to the virtues of peace to the arts and sciences fathers of their people though crowned yet citizens the increase of whose authority augments the happiness of their subjects by destroying that intermediate despotism which intercepts the prayers of the people to the throne if these humane princes have suffered the old laws to subsist it is doubtless because they are deterred by the numberless obstacles which oppose the subversion of errors established by the sanction of many ages and therefore every wise citizen will wish for the increase of their authority End of chapter twenty eight Chapter twenty nine of An Essay on Crimes and Punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan in Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter twenty nine of Imprisonment. That a magistrate, the executor of the laws, should have a power to imprison a citizen, to deprive the man he hates of his liberty upon frivolous pretences and to leave his friend unpunished notwithstanding the strongest proofs of his guilt is an error as common as it is contrary to the end of society which is personal security imprisonment is a punishment which differs from all others in this particular that it necessarily precedes conviction but this difference does not destroy a circumstance which is essential and common to it with all other punishments videlicet that it should never be inflicted but when ordained by the law the law should therefore determine the crime the presumption and the evidence sufficient to subject the accused to imprisonment and examination public report his flight his extrajudicial confession that of an accomplice menaces and his constant enmity with the person injured the circumstances of the crime and such other evidence may be sufficient to justify the imprisonment of a citizen but the nature of this evidence should be determined by the laws and not by the magistrates whose decrees are always contrary to political liberty when they are not particular applications of a general maxim of the public code 
when punishments become less severe and prisons less horrible when compassion and humanity shall penetrate the iron gates of dungeons and direct the obdurate and inexorable ministers of justice the laws may then be satisfied with weaker evidence for imprisonment a person accused imprisoned tried and acquitted ought not to be branded with any degree of infamy among the romans we see that many accused of very great crimes and afterwards declared innocent were respected by the people and honoured with employments in the state but why is the fate of an innocent person so different in this age it is because the present system of penal laws presents to our minds an idea of power rather than justice it is because the accused and convicted are thrown indiscriminately into the same prison because imprisonment is rather a punishment than a means of securing the person of the accused and because the interior power which defends the laws and the exterior which defends the throne and kingdom are separate when they should be united if the first were under the common authority of the laws combined with the right of judging but not however immediately dependent on the magistrate the pomp that attends a military corps would take off the infamy which like all popular opinions is more attached to the manner and form than the thing itself as may be seen in military imprisonment which in the common opinion is not so disgraceful as the civil but the barbarity and ferocity of our ancestors the hunters of the north still subsist among the people in our customs and our laws which are always several ages behind the actual refinements of a nation End of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter thirty of prosecution and prescription the proofs of the crime being obtained and the certainty of it determined it is necessary to allow the criminal time and means for his justification but a time so short as not to diminish that promptitude of punishment which as we have shown is one of the most powerful means of preventing crimes a mistaken humanity may object to the shortness of the time but the force of the objection will vanish if we consider that the danger of the innocent increases with the defects of the legislation the time for inquiry and for justification should be fixed by the laws and not by the judge who in that case would become legislator with regard to atrocious crimes which are long remembered when they are once proved if the criminal have fled no time should be allowed but in less considerable and more obscure crimes a time should be fixed after which the delinquent should be no longer uncertain of his fate for in the latter case the length of time in which the crime is almost forgotten prevents the example of impunity and allows the criminal to amend and become a better member of society general principles will here be sufficient it being impossible to fix precisely the limits of time for any given legislation or for any society in any particular circumstance i shall only add that 
in a nation willing to prove the utility of moderate punishment laws which according to the nature of the crime increase or diminish the time of inquiry and justification considering the imprisonment or the voluntary exile of the criminal as a part of the punishment will form an easy division of a small number of mild punishments for a great number of crimes but it must be observed the time for inquiry and justification should not increase in direct proportion to the atrocities of crimes for the probability of such crimes having been committed is inversely as their atrociousness therefore the time for inquiring ought in some cases to be diminished and that for justification increased at vice versa this may appear to contradict what i have said above namely that equal punishments may be decreed by unequal crimes by considering the time allowed the criminal or the prison as a punishment in order to explain this idea i shall divide crimes into two classes the first comprehends homicide and all greater crimes the second crimes of an inferior degree this distinction is founded in human nature the preservation of life is a natural right the preservation of property is a right of society the motives that induce men to shake off the natural sentiments of compassion which must be destroyed before great crimes can be committed are much less in number than those by which from the natural desire of being happy they are instigated to violate a right which is not founded in the heart of man but is the work of society the different degrees of probability in these two classes require that they should be regulated on different principles in the greatest crimes as they are less frequent and the probability of the innocence of the accused being greater the time allowed him for his justification should be greater and the time of inquiry less for by hastening the definite sentence the flattering hopes of impunity are destroyed which are more dangerous as the crime is more atrocious on the contrary in crimes of less importance the probability of the innocence being less the time of inquiry should be greater and that of justification less as impunity is not so dangerous but this division of crimes into two classes should not be admitted if the consequences of impunity were in proportion to the probability of the crime it should be considered that a person accused whose guilt or innocence is not determined for want of proof may be again imprisoned for the same crime and be subject to a new trial if fresh evidence arises within the time fixed this is in my opinion the best method of providing at the same time for the security and liberty of the subject without favouring one at the expense of the other which may easily happen since both these blessings the unalienable and equal patrimony of every citizen are liable to be invaded the one by open or disguised despotism and the other by tumultuous and popular anarchy End of chapter 30chapter thirty one of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter thirty one of crimes of difficult proof with the foregoing principles in view 
it will appear astonishing that reason hardly ever presided at the formation of the laws of nations that the weakest and most equivocal evidence and even conjectures have been thought sufficient proof for crimes the most atrocious and therefore most improbable the most obscure and chimerical as if it were the interest of the laws and the judge not to inquire into the truth but to prove the crime as if there were not a greater risk of condemning an innocent person when the probability of his guilt is less the generality of men want that vigour of mind and resolution which are as necessary for great crimes as for great virtues and which at the same time produce both the one and the other in those nations which are supported by the activity of their government and a passion for the public good for in those which subsist by their greatness of power or by the goodness of their laws the passions being in a weaker degree seem calculated rather to maintain than to improve the form of government this naturally leads us to an important conclusion videlicet that great crimes do not always produce the destruction of a nation there are some crimes which though frequent in society are of difficult proof a circumstance admitted as equal to the probability of the innocence of the accused but as the frequency of these crimes is not owing to their impunity so much as to other causes the danger of their passing unpunished is of less importance and therefore the time of examination and prescription may be equally diminished these principles are different from those commonly received for it is in crimes which are proved with the greatest difficulty such as adultery and sodomy that presumptions half proofs etc are admitted as if a man could be half innocent and half guilty that is half punishable and half absolvable it is in these cases that torture should exercise its cruel power on the person of the accused the witnesses and even his whole family as with unfeeling indifference some civilians have taught who pretend to dictate laws to nations adultery is a crime which politically considered owes its existence to two causes videlicet pernicious laws and the powerful attraction between the sexes this attraction is similar in many circumstances to gravity the spring of motion in the universe like this it is diminished by distance one regulates the motions of the body the other of the soul but they differ in one respect the force of gravity decreases in proportion to the obstacles that oppose it the other gathers strength and vigour as the obstacles increase if i were speaking to nations guided only by the laws of nature i would tell them that there is a considerable difference between adultery and all other crimes adultery proceeds from an abuse of that necessity which is constant and universal in human nature a necessity anterior to the formation of society and indeed the founder of society itself whereas all other crimes tend to the destruction of society and arise from momentary passions and not from a natural necessity it is the opinion of those who have studied history and mankind that this necessity is constantly in the same degree in the same climate 
if this be true useless or rather pernicious must all laws and customs be which tend to diminish the sum total of the effects of this passion such laws would only burden one part of society with the additional necessities of the other but on the contrary wise are the laws which following the natural course of the river divide the stream into a number of equal branches preventing thus both sterility and inundation conjugal fidelity is always greater in proportion as marriages are more numerous and less difficult but when the interest or pride of families or paternal authority not the inclination of the parties unite the sexes gallantry soon breaks the slender ties in spite of common moralists who exclaim against the effect whilst they pardon the cause but these affections are useless to those who living in the true religion act from sublimer motives which correct the eternal laws of nature the act of adultery is a crime so instantaneous so mysterious and so concealed by the veil which the laws themselves have woven a veil necessary indeed but so transparent as to heighten rather than conceal the charms of the object the opportunities are so frequent and the danger of discovery so easily avoided that it were much easier for the laws to prevent this crime than to punish it when committed to every crime which from its nature must frequently remain unpunished the punishment is an incentive such is the nature of the human mind that difficulties if not insurmountable nor too great for our natural indolence embellish the object and spur us on to the pursuit they are so many barriers that confine the imagination to the object and oblige us to consider it in every point of view in this agitation the mind naturally inclines and fixes itself to the most agreeable part studiously avoiding every idea that might create disgust the crime of sodomy so severely punished by the laws and for the proof of which are employed tortures which often triumph over innocence itself has its source much less in the passions of man in a free and independent state than in society and a slave it is much less the effect of a satiety in pleasures than of that education which in order to make men useful to others begins by making them useless to themselves in those public seminaries where ardent youth are carefully excluded from all commerce with the other sex as the vigour of nature blooms it is consumed in a manner not only useless to mankind but which accelerates the approach of old age the murder of bastard children is in like manner the effect of a cruel dilemma in which a woman finds herself who has been seduced through weakness or overcome by force the alternative is either her own infamy or the death of a being who is incapable of feeling the loss of life how can she avoid preferring the last to the inevitable misery of herself and her unhappy infant the best method of preventing this crime would be effectually to protect the weak woman from that tyranny which exaggerates all vices that cannot be concealed under the cloak of virtue i do not pretend to lessen that just abhorrence which these crimes deserve 
but to discover the sources from whence they spring and i think i may draw the following conclusion that the punishment of a crime cannot be just that is necessary if the laws have not endeavoured to prevent that crime by the best means which times and circumstances would allow End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter thirty two of suicide suicide is a crime which seems not to admit of punishment properly speaking for it cannot be inflicted but on the innocent or upon an insensible dead body in the first case it is unjust and tyrannical for political liberty supposes all punishments entirely personal in the second it has the same effect by way of example as the scourging a statue mankind love life too well the objects that surround them the seducing phantom of pleasure and hope that sweetest error of mortals which makes men swallow such large draughts of evil mingled with a very few drops of good allure them too strongly to apprehend that this crime will ever be common from its unavoidable impunity the laws are obeyed through fear of punishment but death destroys all sensibility what motive then can restrain the desperate hand of suicide he who kills himself does a less injury to society than he who quits his country for ever for the other leaves his property behind him but this carries with him at least part of his substance besides as the strength of society consists in the number of citizens he who quits one nation to reside in another becomes a double loss this then is the question whether it be advantageous to society that its members should enjoy the unlimited privilege of migration every law that is not armed with force or which from circumstances must be ineffectual should not be promulgated opinion which reigns over the minds of men obeys the slow and indirect impressions of the legislator but resists them when violently and directly applied and useless laws communicate their insignificance to the most salutary which are regarded more as obstacles to be surmounted than as safeguards of the public good but further our perceptions being limited by enforcing the observance of laws which are evidently useless we destroy the influence of the most salutary from this principle a wise dispenser of public happiness may draw some useful consequences the explanation of which would carry me too far from my subject which is to prove the inutility of making a nation a prison such a law is vain because unless inaccessible rocks or impassable seas divide the country from all others how will it be possible to secure every point of the circumference or how will you guard the guards themselves besides this crime once committed cannot be punished and to punish it beforehand would be to punish the intention and not the action the will which is entirely out of the power of human laws to punish the absent by confiscating his effects besides the facility of collusion which would inevitably be the case and which without tyranny 
could not be prevented would put a stop to all commerce with other nations to punish the criminal when he returns would be to prevent him from repairing the evil he had already done to society by making his absence perpetual besides any prohibition would increase the desire of removing and would infallibly prevent strangers from settling in the country what must we think of a government which has no means but fear to keep its subjects in their own country to which by the first impressions of their infancy they are so strongly attached the most certain method of keeping men at home is to make them happy and it is the interest of every state to turn the balance not only of commerce but of felicity in favour of its subjects the pleasures of luxury are not the principal sources of this happiness though by preventing the too great accumulation of wealth in a few hands they become a necessary remedy against the too great inequality of individuals which always increases with the progress of society when the populousness of a country does not increase in proportion to its extent luxury favours despotism for where men are most dispersed there is least industry and where there is least industry the dependence of the poor upon the luxury of the rich is greatest and the union of the oppressed against the oppressors is least to be feared in such circumstances rich and powerful men more easily command distinction respect and service by which they are raised to a greater height above the poor for men are more independent the less they are observed and are least observed when most numerous on the contrary when the number of people is too great in proportion to the extent of a country luxury is a check to despotism because it is a spur to industry and because the labour of the poor affords so many pleasures to the rich that they disregard the luxury of ostentation which would remind the people of their dependence hence we see that in vast and depopulated states the luxury of ostentation prevails over that of convenience but in countries more populous the luxury of convenience tends constantly to diminish the luxury of ostentation the pleasure of luxury have this inconvenience that though they employ a great number of hands yet they are only enjoyed by a few whilst the rest who do not partake of them feel the want more sensibly on comparing their state with that of others security and liberty restrained by the laws are the basis of happiness and when attended by these the pleasures of luxury favour population without which they become the instruments of tyranny as the most noble and generous animals fly to solitude and inaccessible deserts and abandon the fertile plains to man their greatest enemy so men reject pleasure itself when offered by the hand of tyranny but to return if it be demonstrated that the laws which imprison men in their own country are vain and unjust it will be equally true of those which punish suicide for that can only be punished after death which is in the power of god alone and it is no crime with regard to man because the punishment falls on an innocent family if it be objected that the consideration of such a punishment may prevent the crime i answer that he who can calmly renounce the pleasure of existence who is so weary of life 
as to brave the idea of eternal misery will never be influenced by the more distant and less powerful considerations of family and children End of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare Bicaria, translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter thirty three of smuggling smuggling is a real offence against the sovereign and the nation but the punishment should not brand the offender with infamy because this crime is not infamous in the public opinion by inflicting infamous punishments for crimes that are not reputed so we destroy that idea where it may be useful if the same punishment be decreed for killing a pheasant as for killing a man or for forgery all difference between these crimes will shortly vanish it is thus that moral sentiments are destroyed in the heart of man sentiments the work of many ages and of much bloodshed sentiments that are so slowly and with so much difficulty produced and for the establishment of which such sublime motives and such an apparatus of ceremonies were thought necessary the crime is owing to the laws themselves for the higher the duties the greater is the advantage and consequently the temptation which temptation is increased by the facility of perpetration when the circumference that is guarded is of great extent and the merchandise prohibited is small in bulk the seizure and loss of the goods attempted to be smuggled together with those that are found along with them is just but it would be better to lessen the duty because men risk only in proportion to the advantage expected this crime being a theft of what belongs to the prince and consequently to the nation why is it not attended with infamy i answer that crimes which men consider as productive of no bad consequences to themselves do not interest them sufficiently to excite their indignation the generality of mankind upon whom remote consequences make no impression do not see the evil that may result from the practice of smuggling especially if they reap from it any present advantage they only perceive the loss sustained by the prince they are not then interested in refusing their esteem to the smuggler as to one who has committed a theft or a forgery or other crimes by which they themselves may suffer from this evident principle that a sensible being only interests himself in those evils with which he is acquainted shall this crime then committed by one who has nothing to lose go unpunished no there are certain species of smuggling which so particularly affect the revenue a part of government so essential and managed with so much difficulty that they deserve imprisonment or even slavery but yet of such a nature as to be proportioned to the crime for example it would be highly unjust that a smuggler of tobacco should suffer the same punishment with a robber or assassin but it would be most uncomfortable to the nature of the offence that the produce of his labour should be applied to the use of the crown which he intended to defraud End of chapter thirty three
Chapter thirty four of Anessi on Crimes and Punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan in Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter thirty four of Bankrupts the necessity of good faith in contracts and the support of commerce oblige the legislator to secure for the creditors the persons of bankrupts it is however necessary to distinguish between the fraudulent and the honest bankrupt the fraudulent bankrupt should be punished in the same manner with him who adulterates the coin for to falsify a piece of coin which is a pledge of the mutual obligations between citizens is not a greater crime than to violate the obligations themselves but the bankrupt who after a strict examination has proved before proper judges that either the fraud or losses of others or misfortunes unavoidable by human prudence have stripped him of his substance upon what barbarous pretence is he thrown into prison and thus deprived of the only remaining good the melancholy enjoyment of mere liberty why is he ranked with criminals and in despair compelled to repent of his honesty conscious of his innocence he lived easy and happy under the protection of those laws which it is true he violated but not intentionally laws dictated by the avarice of the rich and accepted by the poor seduced by that universal and flattering hope which makes men believe that all unlucky accidents are the lot of others and the most fortunate only their share mankind when influenced by the first impressions love cruel laws although being subject to them themselves it is the interest of every person that they should be as mild as possible but the fear of being injured is always more prevalent than the intention of injuring others but to return to the honest bankrupt let his debt if you will not be considered as cancelled till the payment of the whole let him be refused the liberty of leaving the country without leave of his creditors or of carrying into another nation that industry which under a penalty he should be obliged to employ for their benefit but what pretence can justify the depriving an innocent though unfortunate man of his liberty without the least utility to his creditors but say they the hardships of confinement will induce him to discover his fraudulent transactions an event that can hardly be supposed after a rigorous examination of his conduct and affairs but if they are not discovered he will escape unpunished it is i think a maxim of government that the importance of the political inconveniences arising from the impunity of a crime are directly as the injury to the public and inversely as the difficulty of proof it will be necessary to distinguish fraud attended with aggravating circumstances from simple fraud and that from perfect innocence from the first let there be ordained the same punishment as for forgery for the second a less punishment but with the loss of liberty and if perfectly honest let the bankrupt himself choose the method of re-establishing himself and of satisfying his creditors or if he should appear not to have been strictly honest let that be determined by his creditors but these distinctions should be fixed by the laws which alone are impartial and not by the arbitrary and dangerous prudence of judges footnote 
it may be alleged that the interest of commerce and property should be secured but commerce and property are not the end of the social compact but the means of obtaining that end and to expose all the members of society to cruel laws to preserve them from evils necessarily occasioned by the infinite combinations which result from the actual state of political societies would be to make the end subservient to the means a paralogism in all sciences and particularly in politics in the former editions of this work i myself fell into this error when i said that the honest bankrupt should be kept in custody as a pledge for his debts or employed as a slave to work for his creditors i am ashamed of having adopted so cruel an opinion i have been accused of impiety i did not deserve it i have been accused of sedition i deserve it as little but i insulted all the rights of humanity and was never reproached End of footnote. with what ease might a sagacious legislator prevent the greatest part of fraudulent bankruptcies and remedy the misfortunes that befall the honest and industrious a public register of all contracts with the liberty of consulting it allowed to every citizen a public fund formed by a contribution of the opulent merchants for the timely assistance of unfortunate industry were establishments that could produce no real inconveniences and many advantages but unhappily the most simple the easiest yet the wisest laws that wait only for the nod of the legislator to diffuse through nations wealth power and felicity laws which would be regarded by future generations with eternal gratitude are either unknown or rejected a restless and trifling spirit the timid prudence of the present moment a distrust and aversion to the most useful novelties possess the minds of those who are empowered to regulate the actions of mankind End of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter thirty five of sanctuaries are sanctuaries just is a convention between nations mutually to give up their criminals useful in the whole extent of a political state there should be no place independent of the laws their power should follow every subject as the shadow follows the body sanctuaries and impunity differ only in degree and as the effect of punishments depends more on their certainty than their greatness men are more strongly invited to crimes by sanctuaries than they are deterred by punishment to increase the number of sanctuaries is to erect so many little sovereignties for where the laws have no power new bodies will be formed in opposition to the public good and a spirit established contrary to that of the state history informs us that from the use of sanctuaries have arisen the greatest revolutions in kingdoms and in opinions some have pretended that in whatever country a crime that is in action contrary to the laws of society be committed the criminal may be justly punished for it in any other as if the character of subject were indelible or synonymous with or worse than that of slave as if a man could live in one country and be subject to the laws of another 
or be accountable for his actions to two sovereigns or two codes of laws often contradictory there are also those who think that an act of cruelty committed for example at constantinople may be punished at paris for this abstracted reason that he who offends humanity should have enemies in all mankind and be the object of universal execration as if judges were to be the knights errant of human nature in general rather than guardians of particular conventions between men the place of punishment can certainly be no other than that where the crime was committed for the necessity of punishing an individual for the general good subsists there and there only a villain if he has not broke through the conventions of a society of which by my supposition he was not a member may be feared and by force banished and excluded from that society but ought not to be formally punished by the laws which were only intended to maintain the social compact and not to punish the intrinsic malignity of actions whether it be useful that nations should mutually deliver up their criminals although the certainty of there being no part of the earth where crimes are not punished may be a means of preventing them i shall not pretend to determine this question until laws more comfortable to the necessities and rights of humanity and until milder punishments and the abolition of the arbitrary power of opinion shall afford security to virtue and innocence when oppressed and until tyranny shall be confined to the plains of asia and europe acknowledge the universal empire of reason by which the interests of sovereigns and subjects are best united End of chapter thirty five chapter thirty six of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter thirty six of rewards for apprehending or killing criminals let us now inquire whether it be advantageous to society to set a price on the head of a criminal and so to make of every citizen an executioner if the offender has taken refuge in another state the sovereign encourages his subjects to commit a crime and to expose themselves to a just punishment he insults that nation and authorizes the subjects to commit on their neighbors similar usurpations if the criminal still remain in his own country to set a price upon his head is the strongest proof of the weakness of the government he who has strength to defend himself will not purchase the assistance of another besides such an edict confounds all the ideas of virtue and morality already too wavering in the mind of man at one time treachery is punished by the laws at another encouraged with one hand the legislator strengthens the ties of kindred and friendship and with the other rewards the violation of both always in contradiction with himself now he invites the suspecting minds of men to mutual confidence and now he plants distrust in every heart to prevent one crime he gives birth to a thousand such are the expedients of weak nations whose laws are like temporary repairs to a tottering fabric on the contrary as a nation becomes more enlightened 
honesty and mutual confidence become more necessary and are daily tending to unite with sound policy artifice cabal and obscure and indirect actions are more easily discovered and the interest of the whole is better secured against the passions of the individual even the times of ignorance when private virtue was encouraged by public morality may afford instructions and example to more enlightened ages but laws which reward treason excite clandestine war and mutual distrust and oppose that necessary union of morality and policy which is the foundation of happiness and universal peace End of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter thirty seven of attempts accomplices and pardon the laws do not punish the intention nevertheless an attempt which manifests the intention of committing a crime deserves a punishment though less perhaps than if the crime were actually perpetrated the importance of preventing even attempts to commit a crime sufficiently authorizes a punishment but as there may be an interval of time between the attempt and the execution it is proper to reserve the greater punishment for the actual commission that even after the attempt there may be a motive for desisting in like manner with regard to the accomplices they ought not to suffer so severe a punishment as the immediate perpetrator of the crime but this for a different reason when a number of men unite and run a common risk the greater the danger the more they endeavour to distribute it equally now if the principals be punished more severely than the accessories it will prevent the danger from being equally divided and will increase the difficulty of finding a person to execute the crime as his danger is greater by the difference of the punishment there can be but one exception to this rule and that is when the principal receives a reward from the accomplices in that case as the difference of the danger is compensated the punishment should be equal these reflections may appear too refined to those who do not consider that it is of great importance that the laws should leave the associates as few means as possible of agreeing among themselves in some tribunals a pardon is offered to an accomplice in a great crime if he discovers his associates this expedient has its advantages and disadvantages the disadvantages are that the law authorizes treachery which is detested even by the villains themselves and introduces crimes of cowardice which are much more pernicious to a nation than crimes of courage courage is not common and only wants a benevolent power to direct it to the public good cowardice on the contrary is a frequent self-interested and contagious evil which can never be improved into a virtue besides the tribunal which has recourse to this method betrays its fallibility and the laws their weakness by imploring the assistance of those by whom they are violated the advantages are that it prevents great crimes the effects of which being public and the perpetrators concealed 
terrify the people it also contributes to prove that he who violates the laws which are public conventions will also violate private compacts it appears to me that a general law promising a reward to every accomplice who discovers his associates would be better than a special declaration in every particular case because it would prevent the union of those villains as it would inspire a mutual distrust and each would be afraid of exposing himself alone to danger the accomplice however should be pardoned on condition of transportation but it is in vain that i torment myself with endeavouring to extinguish the remorse i feel in attempting to induce the sacred laws the monument of public confidence the foundation of human morality to authorise dissimulation and perfidy but what an example does it offer to a nation to see the interpreters of the laws break their promise of pardon and on the strength of learned subtleties and to the scandal of public faith drag him to punishment who has accepted of their invitation such examples are not uncommon and this is the reason that political society is regarded as a complex machine the springs of which are moved at pleasure by the most dexterous or most powerful End of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter thirty eight of suggestive interrogations the laws forbid suggestive interrogations that is according to the civilians questions which with regard to the circumstances of the crime are special when they should be general or in other words those questions which having an immediate reference to the crime suggest to the criminal an immediate answer interrogations according to the law ought to lead to the fact indirectly and obliquely but never directly or immediately the intent of this injunction is either that they should not suggest to the accused an immediate answer that might acquit him or that they think it contrary to nature that a man should accuse himself but whatever be the motive the laws have fallen into a palpable contradiction in condemning suggestive interrogations whilst they authorize torture can there be an interrogation more suggestive than pain torture will suggest to a robust villain an obstinate silence that he may exchange a greater punishment for a less and to a feeble man confession to relieve him from the present pain which affects him more than the apprehension of the future if a special interrogation be contrary to the right of nature as it obliges a man to accuse himself torture will certainly do it more effectually but men are influenced more by the names than the nature of things he who obstinately refuses to answer the interrogatories deserves a punishment which should be fixed by the laws and that of the severest kind the criminals should not by their silence evade the example which they owe the public but this punishment is not necessary when the guilt of the criminal is indisputable because in that case interrogation is useless as is likewise his confession when there are without it proofs sufficient 
this last case is most common for experience shows that in the greatest number of criminal prosecutions the culprit pleads not guilty end of chapter thirty eight Chapter thirty nine of An Essay on Crimes and Punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan in Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter thirty nine of a particular kind of crimes. The reader will perceive that I have omitted speaking of a certain class of crimes which has covered Europe with blood and raised up those horrid piles from whence amidst clouds of whirling smoke the groans of human victims the crackling of their bones and the frying of their still panting bowels were a pleasing spectacle and an agreeable harmony to the fanatic multitude but men of understanding will perceive that the age and country in which i live will not permit me to inquire into the nature of this crime it were too tedious and foreign to my subject to prove the necessity of a perfect uniformity of opinions in a state contrary to the examples of many nations to prove that opinions which differ from one another only in some subtle and obscure distinctions beyond the reach of human capacity may nevertheless disturb the public tranquillity unless one only religion be established by authority and that some opinions by being contrasted and opposed to each other in their collision strike out the truth whilst others feeble in themselves require the support of power and authority it would i say carry me too far were i to prove that how odious soever is the empire of force over the opinions of mankind from whom it only obtains dissimulation followed by contempt and although it may seem contrary to the spirit of humanity and brotherly love commanded us by reason and authority which we more respect it is nevertheless necessary and indispensable we are to believe that all these paradoxes are solved beyond a doubt and that conformable to the true interests of mankind if practised by a lawful authority i write only of crimes which violate the laws of nature and the social contract and not of sins even the temporal punishment of which must be determined from other principles than those of limited human philosophy End of chapter thirty nine chapter forty of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter forty of false ideas of utility a principal source of errors and injustice are false ideas of utility for example that legislator has false ideas of utility who considers particular more than general conveniences who had rather command the sentiments of mankind than excite them and dares say to reason be thou a slave who would sacrifice a thousand real advantages to the fear of an imaginary or trifling inconvenience who would deprive men of the use of fire for fear of their being burnt and of water for fear of their being drowned and who knows of no means of preventing evil but by destroying it 
the laws of this nature are those which forbid to wear arms disarming those only who are not disposed to commit the crime which the laws mean to prevent can it be supposed that those who have the courage to violate the most sacred laws of humanity and the most important of the code will respect the less considerable and arbitrary injunctions the violation of which is so easy and of so little comparative importance does not the execution of this law deprive the subject of that personal liberty so dear to mankind and to the wise legislator and does it not subject the innocent to all the disagreeable circumstances that should only fall on the guilty it certainly makes the situation of the assaulted worse and the assailants better and rather encourages than prevents murder as it requires less courage to attack unarmed than armed persons it is a false idea of utility that would give to a multitude of sensible beings that symmetry and order which inanimate matter is alone capable of receiving to neglect the present which are the only motives that act with force and constancy on the multitude for the more distant whose impressions are weak and transitory unless increased by that strength of imagination so very uncommon among mankind finally that is a false idea of utility which sacrificing things to names separates the public good from that of individuals there is this difference between a state of society and a state of nature that a savage does no more mischief to another than is necessary to procure some benefit to himself but a man in society is sometimes tempted from a fault in the laws to injure another without any prospect of advantage the tyrant inspires his vassals with fear and servility which rebound upon him with double force and are the cause of his torment fear the more private and domestic it is the less dangerous it is to him who makes it the instrument of his happiness but the more it is public and the greater number of people it affects the greater is the probability that some mad desperate or designing person will seduce others to his party by flattering expectations and this will be the more easily accomplished as the danger of the enterprise will be divided amongst a greater number because the value the unhappy set upon their existence is less as their misery is greater End of chapter 40chapter forty one of venetia on crimes and punishments by cesare Bicaria, translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter forty one of the means of preventing crimes it is better to prevent crimes than to punish them this is the fundamental principle of good legislation which is the art of conducting men to the maximum of happiness and to the minimum of misery if we may apply this mathematical expression to the good and evil of life but the means hitherto employed for that purpose are generally inadequate or contrary to the end proposed it is impossible to reduce the tumultuous activity of mankind to absolute regularity 
for amidst the various and opposite attractions of pleasure and pain human laws are not sufficient entirely to prevent disorders in society such however is the chimera of weak men when invested with authority to prohibit a number of indifferent actions is not to prevent the crimes which they may produce but to create new ones it is to change at will the ideas of virtue and vice which at other times we are told are eternal and immutable to what a situation could we be reduced if everything were to be forbidden that might possibly lead to a crime we must be deprived of the use of our senses for one motive that induces a man to commit a real crime there are a thousand which excite him to those indifferent actions which are called crimes by bad laws if then the probability that a crime will be committed be in proportion to the number of motives to extend the sphere of crimes will be to increase that probability the generality of laws are only exclusive privileges the tribute of all to the advantages of a few would you prevent crimes let the laws be clever and simple let the entire force of the nation be united in their defence let them be intended rather to favour every individual than any particular classes of men let the laws be feared and the laws only the fear of the laws is salutary but the fear of men is a fruitful and fatal source of crimes men enslaved are more voluptuous more debauched and more cruel than those who are in a state of freedom these study the sciences the interest of nations have great objects before their eyes and imitate them but those whose views are confined to the present moment endeavour amidst the distraction of riot and debauchery to forget their situation accustomed to the uncertainty of all events for the laws determine none the consequences of their crimes become problematical which gives an additional force to the strength of their passions in a nation indolent from the nature of the climate the uncertainty of the laws confirms and increases men's indolence and stupidity in a voluptuous but active nation this uncertainty occasions a multiplicity of cabals and intrigues which spread distrust and diffidence through the hearts of all and dissimulation and treachery are the foundation of their prudence in a brave and powerful nation this uncertainty of the laws is at last destroyed after many oscillations from liberty to slavery and from slavery to liberty again End of chapter forty one chapter forty two of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter forty two of the sciences would you prevent crimes let liberty be attended with knowledge as knowledge extends the disadvantages which attend it diminish and the advantages increase a daring impostor who is always a man of some genius is adored by the ignorant populace and despised by men of understanding knowledge facilitates the comparison of objects by shrewing them in different points of view 
when the clouds of ignorance are dispelled by the radiance of knowledge authority trembles but the force of the laws remains immovable men of enlightened understanding must necessarily approve those useful conventions which are the foundation of public safety they compare with the highest satisfaction the inconsiderable portion of liberty of which they are deprived with the sum total sacrificed by others for their security observing that they have only given up the pernicious liberty of injuring their fellow-creatures they bless the throne and the laws upon which it is established it is false that the sciences have always been prejudicial to mankind when they were so the evil was inevitable the multiplication of the human species on the face of the earth introduced war the rudiments of arts and the first laws which were temporary compacts arising from necessity and perishing with it this was the first philosophy and its few elements were just as indolence and want of sagacity in the early inhabitants of the world preserved them from error but necessities increasing with the number of mankind stronger and more lasting impressions were necessary to prevent their frequent relapses into a state of barbarity which became every day more fatal the first religious errors which peopled the earth with false divinities and created a world of invisible beings to govern the visible creation were of the utmost service to mankind the greatest benefactors to humanity were those who dared to deceive and lead pliant ignorance to the foot of the altar by presenting to the minds of the vulgar things out of the reach of their senses which fled as they pursued and always eluded their grasp which as they never comprehended they never despised their different passions were united and attached to a single object this was the first transition of all nations from their savage state such was the necessity and perhaps the only bound of all societies at their first formation i speak not of the chosen people of god to whom the most extraordinary miracles and the most signal favours supplied the place of human policy but as it is the nature of error to subdivide itself ad infinitum so the pretended knowledge which sprung from it transformed mankind into a blind fanatic multitude jarring and destroying each other in the labyrinth in which they were enclosed hence it is not wonderful that some sensible and philosophic minds should regret the ancient state of barbarity this was the first epocha in which knowledge or rather opinions were fatal the second may be found in the difficult and terrible passage from error to truth from darkness to light the violent shock between a mass of errors useful to the few and powerful and the truths so important to the many and the weak with the fermentation of passions excited on that occasion were productive of infinite evils to unhappy mortals in the study of history whose principal periods after certain intervals much resemble each other we frequently find in the necessary passage from the obscurity of ignorance to the light of philosophy and from tyranny to liberty its natural consequence one generation sacrificed to the happiness of the next 
but when this flame is extinguished and the world delivered from its evils truth after a very slow progress sits down with monarchs on the throne and is worshipped in the assemblies of nations shall we then believe that light diffused among the people is more destructive than darkness and that the knowledge of the relation of things can ever be fatal to mankind ignorance may indeed be less fatal than a small degree of knowledge because this adds to the evils of ignorance the inevitable errors of a confined view of things on this side of the bounds of truth but a man of enlightened understanding appointed guardian of the laws is the greatest blessing that a sovereign can bestow on a nation such a man is accustomed to behold the truth and not to fear it unacquainted with the greatest part of those imaginary and insatiable necessities which so often put virtue to the proof and accustomed to contemplate mankind from the most elevated point of view he considers the nation as his family and his fellow-citizens as brothers the distance between the great and the vulgar appears to him the less as the number of mankind he has in view is greater the philosopher has necessities and interests unknown to the vulgar and the chief of these is not to belie in public the principles he taught in obscurity and the habit of loving virtue for its own sake a few such philosophers would constitute the happiness of a nation which however would be but of short duration unless by good laws the number were so increased as to lessen the probability of an improper choice End of chapter forty two chapter forty three of nessie on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter forty three of magistrates another method of preventing crimes is to make the observance of the laws and not their violation the interest of the magistrate the greater the number of those who constitute the tribunal the less is the danger of corruption because the attempt will be more difficult and the power and temptation of each individual will be proportionably less if the sovereign by pomp and the austerity of edicts and by refusing to hear the complaints of the oppressed accustom his subjects to respect the magistrates more than the laws the magistrates will gain indeed but it will be at the expense of public and private security End of chapter forty three chapter forty four of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter forty four of rewards yet another method of preventing crimes is to reward virtue upon this subject the laws of all nations are silent if the rewards proposed by academics for the discovery of useful truths have increased our knowledge and multiplied good books is it not probable that rewards distributed by the beneficent hand of a sovereign would also multiply virtuous actions the coin of honour is inexhaustible and is abundantly fruitful in the hands of a prince who distributes it wisely End of chapter forty four
Chapter forty five of An Essay on Crimes and Punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan in Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter forty five of Education. Finally, the most certain method of preventing crimes is to perfect the system of education but this is an object too vast and exceeds my plan an object if i may venture to declare it which is so intimately connected with the nature of government that it will always remain a barren spot cultivated only by a few wise men a great man who is persecuted by that world he has enlightened and to whom we are indebted for many important truths has most amply detailed the principal maxims of useful education this chiefly consists in presenting to the mind a small number of select objects in substituting the originals for the copies both of physical and moral phenomena in leading the pupil to virtue by the easy road of sentiment and in withholding him from evil by the infallible power of necessary inconveniences rather than by command which only obtains a counterfeit and momentary obedience End of chapter forty five Chapter forty six of An Essay on Crimes and Punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan in Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter forty six of Pardons. As punishments become more mild, clemency and pardon are less necessary happy the nation in which they will be considered as dangerous clemency which has often been deemed a sufficient substitute for every other virtue in sovereigns should be excluded in a perfect legislation where punishments are mild and the proceedings in criminal cases regular and expeditious this truth will seem cruel to those who live in countries where from the absurdity of the laws and the severity of punishments pardons and the clemency of the prince are necessary it is indeed one of the noblest prerogatives of the throne but at the same time a tacit disapprobation of the laws clemency is a virtue which belongs to the legislator and not to the executor of the laws a virtue which ought to shine in the code and not in private judgment to show mankind that crimes are sometimes pardoned and that punishment is not the necessary consequence is to nourish the flattering hope of impunity and is the cause of their considering every punishment inflicted as an act of injustice and oppression the prince in pardoning gives up the public security in favour of an individual and by his ill-judged benevolence proclaims a public act of impunity let then the executors of the laws be inexorable but let the legislator be tender indulged and humane he is a wise architect who erects his edifice on the foundation of self-love and contrives that the interest of the public shall be the interest of each individual who is not obliged by particular laws and irregular proceedings to separate the public good from that of individuals and erect the image of public felicity on the basis of fear and distrust but like a wise philosopher 
he will permit his brethren to enjoy in quiet that small portion of happiness which the immense system established by the first cause permits them to taste on this earth which is but a point in the universe a small crime is sometimes pardoned if the person offended chooses to forgive the offender this may be an act of good nature and humanity but it is contrary to the good of the public for although a private citizen may dispense with satisfaction for the injury he has received he cannot remove the necessity of example the right to punish does not belong to any individual in particular but to society in general or the sovereign he may renounce his own portion of this right but cannot give up that of others End of chapter 46chapter forty seven of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter forty seven conclusion i conclude with this reflection that the severity of punishments ought to be in proportion to the state of the nation among a people hardly yet emerged from barbarity they should be most severe as strong impressions are required but in proportion as the minds of men become softened by their intercourse in society the severity of punishments should be diminished if it be intended that the necessary relation between the object and the sensation should be maintained from what i have written results the following general theorem of considerable utility though not conformable to custom the common legislator of nations that a punishment may not be an act of violence of one or of many against a private member of society it should be public immediate and necessary the least possible in the case given proportioned to the crime and determined by the laws End of chapter forty seven chapter one of the commentary by voltaire to an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn a commentary on the essays on crimes and punishments chapter one the circumstances that occasioned this commentary my mind was so full of reflections arising from the perusal of the little work on crimes and punishments which is in moral science what the few remedies capable of alleviating our bodily complaints are in medicine i flattered myself that this work would soften what remained of barbarism in the criminal jurisprudence of a great many nations i hoped for some reformation in human nature itself when i was informed that a girl of eighteen years of age handsome possessed of useful talents and of a very respectable family had just been hung in one of the provinces her crime was having yielded to illicit love and in afterwards abandoning her child the fruit of the connection this unhappy girl flying from her parents house was taken in labour and delivered alone and without assistance near a brook the feeling of shame which in the sex is a powerful passion gave her strength to return to the house of her father and to conceal her situation she left her child exposed it was found the next day the mother ascertained 
condemned to death and executed the first fault of this girl should have been considered by her family as a family secret or met with protection from the law because the seducer should be bound to repair the evil he had done because weakness has a claim to indulgence because every feeling is in favour of a woman whose concealed pregnancy often exposes her life at the same time that discovery of her condition would destroy her reputation and because the difficulty of providing for the support of her child is a very great additional misfortune her second fault was more criminal she abandoned the fruit of her weakness and exposed it to the risk of perishing but because a child died was it absolutely necessary to destroy the mother she did not murder it she flattered herself that some passenger would have compassion for an innocent being she might even have had an intention of returning to the view of finding her child and affording it every necessary assistance the feeling too is so natural that its existence in the heart of a mother ought to be presumed i know the law is positive against a woman under the circumstances above related in the province to which i alluded but at the same time is not this law unjust inhuman and pernicious unjust because it makes no distinction between the woman who murders and she who abandons her child inhuman because it cruelly inflicts the punishment of death on an unfortunate being whose only crime is weakness and anxiety to conceal her miserable situation pernicious because it forcibly tears from society a fellow-being capable of adding to the subjects of the state and that too in a province where they are sensible of the want of inhabitants charity has not as yet provided in that province houses of reception where children who are exposed may receive necessary care where charity is wanting law is always cruel it would certainly be better to prevent these unhappy occurrences which happen but too often than simply to rest satisfied with punishing them the real object of jurisprudence is to prevent the commission of crimes not to punish with death the weaker sex especially when it is evident that their faults are unaccompanied with malice and who are more than adequately punished by the feelings of their own hearts furnish as far as possible to those who may be tempted to do evil the means of avoiding it and you will have fewer criminals to punish End of chapter one chapter two of the commentary by voltaire to an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter two of punishments the unfortunate occurrence and the severe law with which i have been so struck induced me to cast my eyes on the criminal code of nations the humane author of the essay on crimes and punishments had but too much reason to complain that the latter was too frequently disproportioned to the former and sometimes even detrimental to the state they were intended to serve ingenuous punishments to imagine which the human mind seems to have exhausted itself in order to render death terrible seem rather the inventions of tyranny than of justice the punishment of the wheel was first introduced into germany during times of anarchy when those who usurped regal power wished to terrify by the studied preparation of unheard-of torment whosoever should dare to make an attempt upon their authority 
in england they ripped up the belly of a man convinced of high treason tore out his heart dashed it in his face and then threw it upon the fire and what very frequently constituted the crime of high treason during the civil wars a faithful adherence to an unfortunate monarch and sometimes the expression of an opinion upon the doubtful rights of a conqueror time however rendered their manners milder they continue notwithstanding to tear out the heart but it is always after the death of the criminal the apparatus death is dreadful but the death itself is easy if death can ever be said to be easy end of chapter two chapter three of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter three of the punishments of heretics the denunciation of the punishment of death against those who differed from the established church in certain points of doctrine was peculiarly the act of tyranny no christian emperor before the time of the tyrant maximus ever thought of condemning any man to punishment merely on account of controversial points it is true that it was two spanish bishops who pursued to death the priscillianists under maximus but it is also not the less true that this tyrant was willing to gratify the ruling party by shedding the blood of heretics barbarity and justice were viewed by him with equal indifference jealous of theodosius who was also a spaniard he flattered himself with the idea of depriving him of the empire of the east having already usurped that of the west theodosius was detested for his cruelties but he understood the art of gaining to his party the heads of the church maximus was desirous by displaying the same zeal of attaching the spanish bishops to his faction he flattered both the old and the new religion he was a man as treacherous and inhuman as indeed were all those who at this period aspired to or obtained the empire the government of this vast portion of the world was similar to that of the algiers at the present day the soldiery created and dethroned the emperors they selected them often from among the natives of their country regarded as barbarous theodosius opposed to his antagonist other barbarians from scythia it was he who filled the armies with goths and who raised up alaric the conqueror of rome in this horrible state of confusion the empire belonged to him who could strengthen his party most effectually by any and every means in his power maximus just had procured the assassination at lyon of gratian the colleague of theodosius and meditated the destruction of valentinian the second who while yet a child had been nominated as the successor of gratian at rome he assembled at treves a powerful army composed of gauls and germans he was also levying troops in spain when two spanish bishops idasio and ithacus or itasius men who possessed much influence came and demanded of him the blood of priscillian and of all his adherents who were persuaded that souls are emanations from god that the trinity does not include three hypostases and who moreover carried their sacrilegious doings so far 
as actually to fast on sundays maximus half pagan half christian was soon aware of the enormity of these crimes the holy bishops idasio and itasius also obtained permission to torture priscillian and his adherents before they put them to death they were both present at the executions in order to see that all things were regularly conducted and they returned home praising god and numbering maximus the defender of the faith among the saints but maximus being defeated by theodosius and afterwards murdered at the feet of his vanquisher had not the honour to be canonised it is proper at the same time to remark that st martin bishop of tours who was a truly good man solicited the pardon of priscillian but being himself accused of being a heretic he returned to tours for fear of being put to the torture at trevis as for priscillian he had the consolation after being hanged however of being looked upon by his followers as a martyr they celebrated the day of his canonization and they would probably do so to this day if there were any priscillianists remaining in the world this example made the whole church tremble but soon after it was not only successfully imitated but even surpassed priscillianists had perished by the sword by the halter and by stoning to death a young lady of quality suspected of having fasted on a sunday was only stoned to death at bordeaux these punishments however appeared too mild it having been duly proved that god required heretics to be roasted alive by a slow fire the convincing argument offered in support of this opinion was that it was in that manner that god himself punishes them in another world to which they added that all princes and all representatives of princes including therein all petty magistrates were the images of god in this sublunary world in pursuance of this principle they everywhere burnt all witches and sorcerers such personages being manifestly under the empire of the devil and extended the same charity to all heterodox christians who were deemed more criminal and dangerous than even sorcerers themselves the precise nature of the heresy with which the priests whom king robert the son of hugh and constance his wife ordered to be burnt in their presence at orleans in ten twenty two were contaminated is not known how indeed it should be known there being at that time none but some few scholars and monks who could read is not easy to determine this fact however is well established that robert and his wife satiated their eyes with the view of this most abominable spectacle one of these secretaries had been confessor to constance who thought that she could in no way better repair the misfortune of having confessed herself to a heretic than by seeing him devoured by the flames custom ripens into law from that period down to the present day the church has continued to burn those who were or who at least appeared to be blackened by the crime of erroneous opinion End of chapter three chapter four of the commentary by voltaire on anessi on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter four of the extirpation of heresies we ought it appears to me 
in matters of heresy to distinguish between opinion and faction from the first ages of christianity opinions have been divided on the subject of religious duty the christians of alexandria did not agree on many points with those of antioch the achaeans were at variance with the asiatics this diversity of opinion has existed in every age and in all probability will continue forever jesus christ who alone would have united all the faithful in one opinion did not do so it is fair therefore to presume that such was not his intention but that his design was rather to exercise all his churches in performances of charity and acts of indulgence towards each other by permitting the establishment of different systems which however should all unite in acknowledging him as their lord and master these sects for a long period of time either tolerated by the roman emperors or concealed in quiet obscurity were unable to persecute each other as they were in all equal subjection to the roman magistrates they only possessed the right of disputation when persecuted by the magistrates they all claimed the privilege of nature suffer us said they to worship our god in peace do not deny to us the liberty you grant to the jews every sect at the present day has a right to hold the same language to their oppressors they can say with justice to those who have granted privileges to the jews treat us at least as you treat these children of jacob let us like them worship god according to the dictates of our own consciences our opinion will injure your kingdom no more than judaism you tolerate the enemies of jesus christ tolerate at least us who are his worshippers and who differ from yourselves only in some trifling theological subtleties do not deprive yourselves of useful subjects it is of importance to you to possess our exertions in your navy in your manufactories and in the cultivation of the soil and it is of trifling import to you that we differ in some few articles of faith it is our labour that you stand in need of and we do not wish you to adopt our catechism faction is a very different thing it always happens and that necessarily too that a persecuted sect degenerates into a faction the oppressed naturally unite and encourage each other they are more industrious in the work of strengthening their party than the reigning sect are in the business of extermination they crush or are crushed precisely so it happened after the persecution set on foot in the year three hundred and three by galerius during the two last years of the reign of diocletian the christians having been favoured by diocletian for a period of eighteen years were too numerous and too rich to be exterminated they attached themselves to constantinus chlorus they fought for his son constantine and an entire revolution in the empire was the consequence trifling events may be compared with those that are great when they are directed by the same spirit similar revolutions took place in holland scotland and switzerland when ferdinand and isabella drove out of spain the jews who were settled there before the then reigning house before the moors and even before the carthaginians the jews if they had been as warlike as they were rich and could have made arrangements with the arabs might easily have brought about a revolution in spain in short no sect ever succeeded in producing a change in the government of a country until despair furnished them with the means 
mahomet himself succeeded simply because he was driven from mecca and a reward offered for his head would you prevent then any sect from overturning a state exercise toleration imitate the wise conduct by which england germany and scotland are regulated government has but one choice to make with regard to the mode of treating a new sect that of putting to death without mercy the chiefs of the sect and all their adherents men women and children or that of tolerating them when the sect is numerous the first method is that of a monster the other that of a sage bind every subject to the state with the chains of his own interest let the quaker and the turk find their advantage in living under the protection of your laws religion is a matter between god and man the performance of civil duties a question between government and the people End of chapter four chapter five of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter five of blasphemy and profanation louis the ninth king of france who for his virtue was numbered among the saints made a law against blasphemers he condemned them to a new species of punishment that of having the tongue pierced with a red-hot iron this was a kind of lex talionis the member that had sinned suffered the whole punishment but it was very difficult to determine what was really blasphemy in the transport of rage in the excitement of joy even in common conversation expressions often escape from a man which strictly speaking are merely expletives such as the selah and the va of the hebrews the pol and the edipol of the latins and the per deus immortales an expression made use of every moment without the least intention of swearing by the immortal gods the words called oaths and blasphemy usually consist of vague terms which may be variously interpreted the law punishing those making use of them seems to have been taken from the jewish commandment which says thou shalt not take the name of god in vain the best interpreters think that this law has relation only to perjury and there is great reason to believe they are right as the word shav in the original which is translated in vain strictly speaking signifies perjury now who can discover perjury in the words cadetis sang bleu ventre bleu corps bleu the jews swore by the life of god as the lord liveth it was a common phrase so that the only thing forbidden was lying at the time that god was called upon to witness the truth of what the party said philip augustus in eleven eighty one condemned such of the nobility of his kingdom as should pronounce the words te bleu ventre bleu corps bleu sang bleu to pay a fine and ordered commoners to be drowned the first part of this ordinance seems puerile the second was abominable it was an outrage of human nature to drown a commoner for the fault which a nobleman expiated by paying a few pence of the money of those times the natural consequence was that this extraordinary law remained unexecuted as indeed did many other laws 
particularly during the time that the king was under a sentence of excommunication and his kingdom laid under an interdict by pope celestine the third st louis inflamed with holy zeal gave orders that whosoever should pronounce the indecent words we have mentioned should have either his tongue bored or his upper lip cut off but a respectable citizen of paris having lost his tongue in consequence of the punishment complained to pope innocent the fourth who represented with decision to the king that the punishment was too severe for the crime the king for the future desisted from this severity happy had it been for mankind if the popes had never affected any other superiority over kings the ordinance of louis the fourteenth of the year sixteen sixty six directs that whosoever shall be convicted of having sworn by and blasphemed the holy name of god of his most holy mother or of his saints shall for the first offence pay a fine for the second third and fourth offence a double triple and quadruple fine for the fifth offence be put in the stocks for the sixth shall stand in the pillory and have the upper lip cut off and for the seventh offence have the tongue entirely cut out this law appears to be wise and humane it inflicts a severe punishment on a sevenfold repetition of the crime a thing scarcely to be anticipated with regard to those more daring profanations designated by the term of sacrilege our compilations of criminal jurisprudence where decisions are reported which however we are not to consider as laws make mention only of the crime of church robbery and there is no positive law on this subject condemning the criminal to the flames the laws also are silent on the subject of public impiety either because such folly was not anticipated or that there exists great difficulty in specifying the acts necessary to constitute the offence the crime is therefore left as far as regards punishment to the discretion of the judges justice however should not leave any offence undefined or its punishment arbitrary in cases that occur so rarely what it may be asked is the proper course for a judge to pursue he ought to consider the age of the offender the nature of his offence the degree of evil disposition and obstinacy manifested the public scandal to which it may have given rise and particularly whether or no there exists a necessity for a terrible public example pro qualitate personae proque rei conditione et temporis et atatis et sexus vel severius vel clementius statuendem and if the law does not expressly provide the punishment of death for the crime what judge can dream himself bound to authorize its infliction if there must be a punishment if the law is silent a judge should without hesitation award the mildest punishment in his power because he himself is a man sacrilegious profanations are never committed except by young and dissipated men would you punish them for this crime as severely as if they had committed murder on a brother their youth itself pleads in their favour they cannot even dispose of their property because they are supposed to want the maturity of judgment necessary to anticipate the probable consequence of an imprudent transaction it is therefore reasonable to suppose that they cannot properly estimate the results of an impious sally 
would you treat a dissolute young man who in a frolic had profaned not stolen a sacred image with the severity that you treated a brinvilliers who poisoned her father and all his family there is no existing law that condemns the unhappy wretch you create one in order to subject him to the severest punishment he deserves an exemplary chastisement but does he merit tortures at the thought of which nature shudders in addition to a violent death but he has sinned against god true he has most grievously deal with him then as god would deal if penitent god forgives him cause him therefore bitterly to repent but at the same time forgive him also your own illustrious montesquieu has said our duty is to reverence god not to avenge him let us consider well his words they do not mean that we are to neglect the maintenance of public decorum but as the judicious author of the essay on crimes and punishment observes they demonstrate the absurdity of the attempts of an insect to avenge the insulted majesty of the arbitrator of the universe neither the magistrate of a pity village nor the judge of an imperial city is a moses or a joshua End of chapter five chapter six of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter six of the indulgence of the romans in matters of religion throughout europe the conversation of enlightened men has often turned upon the surprising contrast existing between the roman laws and the barbarous institutions by which they were succeeded and obscured as the ruins of a splendid city are hidden by accumulating rubbish doubtless the roman senate felt as profound a veneration for the supreme being as we do and held the secondary immortal gods who were dependent upon their eternal ruler in as much consideration as we do the saints ab jove principium was the common form of invocation pliny in his panegyric on Trajan begins by averring that the romans never omitted to invoke the deity when they entered upon business or at the commencement of their speeches footnote bene ac sapienter patres conscripti maiores instituerunt ut rerum agendarum ita dicendi initium applicationibus cepere etc End of footnote. Cicero and Livy confirm the assertion. No people were ever more religious, but they were also too wise and too magnanimous to condescend to punish idle language or philosophical opinions. They were incapable of inflicting a barbarous punishment on those who, with Cicero himself an augur, had no faith in auguries still less did they persecute those and among others julius caesar who made the assertion before the assembled senate who said that the gods do not punish men after death it has been often remarked that the senate permitted the chorus in the troads to utter the following sentiments before the audience in the public theatre at rome there is nothing to be looked for after death and death itself is nothing thou askest in what place the dead remain where they remained before they had existence 
if there ever was profanity surely this is it and from ennius to ausonius all is profanity notwithstanding the respect generally paid to public worship why were these things disregarded by the roman senate simply because they did not interfere with the government of the state and did no injury whatever to any institution or religious ceremony the police of the romans was excellent and notwithstanding what we have just related they continued to be absolute masters of the fairest portion of the world till the reign of theodosius the second the maxim of the senate was deorum offense dies curae that offences committed against the gods concerned the gods alone the senators themselves being at the head of religious affairs were under no apprehensions that they might be forced by a convocation of priests to administer to their vengeance under the pretext that the almighty was to be avenged they never said let us tear the impious to pieces lest we be deemed impious ourselves let us prove to the priesthood by our cruelty that we are no less religious than they yes but our religion is more holy than that of the romans impiety is therefore a much greater crime with us than with them granted god will punish it the duty of man is to punish the criminality of impiety when it assumes the shape of public disorder but if in committing the act of impiety not even a handkerchief has been stolen by the offender if he has not done the smallest injury to any one if the rights of religion have not been disturbed shall we punish i repeat the man committing such an act of impiety as we would a patricide the marshal d'ancre caused a white cock to be killed at the full of the moon does such an act of folly call upon us to burn alive the marshal d'ancre est modus in rebus sunt certi denique fines nec scrutia dignum horribili sectare flagello end of chapter six chapter seven of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter seven of the crime of unlawful preaching story of anthony a calvinist preacher if he comes secretly into certain of the provinces for the purpose of preaching clandestinely to a congregation is punished with death if discovered and those who may have furnished him with a meal or a night's lodging are liable to be sent to the galleys for life in some countries a jesuit detected preaching is hanged is it for the purpose of revenging god's cause that the calvinist and jesuit are ordered to be executed do not both parties justify their deeds by the following evangelical law whosoever hearkeneth not unto the church let him be treated as a heathen and a publican but the gospel does not enjoin us to hang either the heathen or the publican or have they built upon the passage in deuteronomy if among you a prophet arise and that which he says come to pass and he says unto you let us follow strange gods and if thy brother or thy son or thy wife or the friend of thy heart say unto thee come let us follow strange gods let them straightway be killed strike thou first and all the people after thee 
but neither the calvinist nor the jesuit have said come let us follow strange guards the councillor dubourg the canon jehan chauvin commonly called calvin the spanish physician servetus and gentilis a native of calabria all worshipped the same god yet the president minard caused dubourg to be hanged and the friends of dubourg procured the assassination of minard calvin caused servetus to be burned alive and had the additional consolation of successfully contributing in no ordinary degree to bring gentilis to the block the successors of calvin burnt anthony was it reason piety or justice that produced all these murders the story of anthony is one of the most singular we find recorded in the annals of frenzy the following account of him i have extracted from a very curious manuscript and the story is also partly related by jacob spohn anthony was born at brieux in lorrain of catholic parents and studied at pont a mousson with the jesuits at metz he was converted to the protestant faith by the preacher ferry on his arrival at nancy he was prosecuted as a heretic and but for the timely assistance of a friend would inevitably have been hanged he fled for refuge to sedan where being taken for a papist he narrowly escaped assassination as if aware that some strange fatality attended him and convinced that his life was safer neither among protestants nor catholics he went to venice and there embraced judaism he was sincere in the persuasion and maintained it too to the last moment of his life that the jewish was the only true religion and that as it had once been so it would forever continue so to remain his jewish brethren did not circumcise him for fear of giving offence to the civil magistrate but he was not on that account the less a jew at heart he made no open profession of his new faith and having taken a journey to geneva in the character of a preacher he became president of the college and finally exercised the office that there gives the title of minister the continual combat in his breast between the doctrine of calvin which he was under the necessity of preaching and the religion of moses the only religion in which he believed produced a long illness he became melancholy and finally quite deranged in his agonies he exclaimed that he was a jew the ministers of the gospel came to visit and endeavoured to bring him back to reason but he answered that he adored none but the god of israel that it was impossible for god to change and that god could never have promulgated engraven with his own hand a law he purposed to abolish he declaimed against christianity but afterwards retracted all that he had said he wrote a profession of faith for the purpose of escaping punishment but after having written it the unfortunate persuasion of his heart prevented him from signing it and the city council assembled to ascertain what was to be done with the unhappy man the minority of the priests assembled for this purpose were of opinion that he was an object of compassion and that their first endeavours should be directed to cure his mental disorder rather than to inflict punishment on him the majority however decided that he deserved to be burned alive which was accordingly executed this transaction took place in sixteen thirty two a century of reason and virtue scarcely suffice to expiate such a deed 
End of chapter 7chapter eight of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter eight the story of simon morin the tragical end of simon morin is hardly less shocking than that of anthony in the midst of the gaieties of a splendid court surrounded by gallantry and pleasure and during the season of greatest festivity at paris this unhappy wretch breathed his last in the flames in the year sixteen sixty three he was a deranged man who believed that he saw visions and even carried his folly so far as to imagine that he was sent from god and gave out that he was incorporated with jesus christ the parliament very judiciously condemned him to imprisonment in a madhouse what is exceeding singular there was at that time confined in the same madhouse another crazy man who called himself the eternal father simon morin was so struck with the folly of his companion that his eyes were opened to the truth of his own condition he appeared for a time to have recovered his right senses and having made known his penitence to the magistrates of the town obtained unfortunately for himself a release from confinement some time afterwards he relapsed into his former state of derangement and began to dogmatize his unhappy destiny made him acquainted with saint sorlin desmartes who was for some time his friend but who afterwards from jealousy excited by the circumstances of their both belonging to the same holy trade became his most deadly persecutor desmartes was not less visionary than morin his first follies were indeed innocent he punished the tragi comedies of erigone and mirame with a translation of the psalms the romance of araine and the poem of clovis to which he added the office of the holy virgin in verse he likewise published dithyrambic poems enriched with incentives against homer and virgil from this species of folly he proceeded to another of a more serious nature he became furious against poor royal and after avowing that he had perverted some women to atheism commenced the career of a prophet he pretended that god had placed in his hands the key of the treasures of the apocalypse that with that key he would produce the reform of all humankind and that he was about to march against the Jocenists with an army of an hundred and forty thousand men nothing could have been more rational than to have confined him in the same cell with simon morin will it be credited that he met with encouragement from the jesuit anna the king's confessor he persuaded anna that poor simon morin was establishing a sect almost as dangerous as jansenism itself and finally having carried his infamy so far as to turn informer he obtained from the lieutenant criminal an order for the arrest of his unfortunate rival i scarce dare relate the result simon morin was condemned to be burned alive when about to conduct him to the stake the executioner found a paper in one of his stockings in which he begged forgiveness of god for all his errors that alone ought to have saved him but the sentence was irrevocable and he was executed without mercy 
such deeds harrow up the soul yet show me the country where scenes as dreadful have not taken place men have everywhere forgotten that they were brethren and have persecuted each other even unto death the most powerful consolation to human nature is that those dreadful times are passed away to return no more End of chapter eight chapter nine of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter nine of witches in seventeen forty nine a woman was burnt in the bishopric of würzburg for the crime of witchcraft an extraordinary phenomenon in the present century is it possible that nations who boast of their reformation of trampling superstitions under foot who indeed supposed that they had attained the perfection of reason could believe in witchcraft and upon the strength of such belief proceed to burn poor women accused of that crime and this more than a hundred years after the pretended reformation of their reason about the year sixteen fifty two a countrywoman named michel chaudron belonging to the little territory of geneva met the devil in the road leading out of the city the devil gave her a kiss received her homage and imprinted on her upper lip and right breast the mark he is wont to bestow on those whom he chooses to distinguish as favourites this seal of the devil is a little mark which renders the skin insensible as we are assured by the demonographical civilians of those times the devil then ordered michel chaudron to bewitch two girls she obeyed her master punctually the parents of the girls took legal measures against her for the crime of witchcraft the girls were interrogated and confronted with the accused they declared that they felt a continual prickling all over their body and that they were bewitched physicians at least those who were called physicians at that time were called in they examined the girls they also searched on the body of michel for the devil's marks called in the statement of the case satanic marks in one of these they thrust a long needle which produced no trifling degree of torture the blood flowed readily enough and michel gave sufficient evidence by her cries that the satanic marks had not rendered the part insensible the judges finding the evidence of michel's being a witch defective proceeded to torture her a method that infallibly furnishes sufficient evidence of any fact the wretched woman confessed during her agonies everything they desired the physicians again sought the satanic marks they found a little black spot upon one of her thighs into this they thrust the needle the torture the poor creature had undergone rendered her insensible to the pain and she did not cry out of course the crime was fully proved but as a dawn of civilization then began to appear in the world she was strangled previous to being burned at the period of which we are speaking sixteen fifty two every tribunal of christian europe resounded with similar sentences and fire and faggot were universally employed as well against witchcraft as heresy nay it was thought a matter of reproach to the turks that they had neither witches nor demoniacs among them 
and the absence of the latter was urged as a decisive proof of the falsehood of their religion a zealous friend to public welfare humanity and true religion has in one of his works in favour of innocence informed us that christian tribunals have condemned to death above a hundred thousand persons accused of the crime of witchcraft if to these judicial murders be added the much superior number of immolated heretics that portion of the globe will be found to resemble a vast scaffold covered with victims and executioners and surrounded by judges guards and spectators End of chapter nine chapter ten of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter ten of capital punishment it is an old observation that a man after he is hanged is good for nothing and that punishments intended to benefit society should at the same time be useful to society it is very evident that a score of robust highwaymen condemned for life to labour on some public work render through the medium of their punishment some service to the state and that their deaths would be of service to no one but the public executioner thieves are seldom executed in england transportation to the colonies is substituted a similar plan was pursued throughout the vast empire of russia where the self-created power of elizabeth during its whole continuance did not require a single execution the superior genius who succeeded her in seventeen sixty two catherine the second has adopted the same maxim it has not been discovered that crimes multiply in consequence of this humanity and generally speaking criminals banished to siberia have been thoroughly reformed the same remark has been made with regard to the english colonies this happy change astonishes us yet nothing is more natural the convicts are obliged to labour incessantly in order to support life the opportunities for vice are wanting they marry and a new population is the consequence oblige men to labour and you render them respectable it is notorious that few crimes of an atrocious caste are committed in the country except perhaps when too many holidays lead to idleness and consequent debauchery a roman citizen was never capitally punished except for crimes that endangered the safety of the republic they our masters our first legislators were sparing of the blood of their fellow-citizens we are prodigal of that of our own the delicate and fatal question whether a judge is authorized to pronounce sentence of death when the law does not expressly point out the punishment of a crime has often been discussed it was solemnly argued before the emperor henry the seventh who decided that no judge could exercise such a power there are certainly some criminal cases either so rare so complicated or attended by such extraordinary circumstances that the laws of more than one country have been obliged to leave the remedies for such singular occurrences to be determined by the discretion of judges but where there happens one case in which it becomes necessary to put to death a criminal to whom the law does not judge death as the measure of his punishment 
a thousand cases arise in which humanity could lead us to spare life in opposition to the sentence of the law footnote infinitely less mischief arises from suffering a crime to go unpunished than to sentence the criminal to capital punishment when unauthorized by an express provision of law it is depriving punishment of its legitimate character that of being inflicted as a consequence of crime and not as avenging the guilt of any particular individual any law permitting a judge to inflict the punishment of death secures impunity to him should he exercise the power but it cannot absolve him from the guilt in a moral point of view of murder besides how is it possible to conceive the existence of a crime as detrimental to the welfare of society as the continuance in being of the man who commits would be dangerous and yet that the occurrence of this very crime should never be anticipated by an enlightened legislator that it should be as well difficult to foresee as to determine with precision the acts by which it shall be constituted End of footnote the sort of justice is committed to our hands but we ought rather to blunt than render its edge more keen it remains in its sheath in the presence of royalty tis to admonish us that it should be rarely drawn in addition to these reflections we should not forget that there have been judges who delighted in blood such was jeffreys in england such in france was the character who received the surname of coutet the beheader those men were never born to the magistracy nature intended them for the executioners of justice End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter eleven of the execution of sentences must we go to the extremities of the earth must we have recourse to the law of china to learn how sparing we ought to be of human blood the tribunals of that country have existed during a period of more than four thousand years yet at the present day a peasant at the extremity of the empire remains unexecuted until the proceedings in his case have been transmitted to the emperor who causes them to be thrice reviewed by one of his tribunals after which he signs the warrant for execution or a commutation of punishment or grants him a pardon footnote the author of the spirit of laws who has intermingled so many charming truths in his work seems to be egregiously mistaken when in order to support his assertion that the vague sentiment of honour is the support of monarchies and virtue of republics he says of the chinese i am ignorant in what honour consists among nations who are governed by the bastinado surely because they disperse the mob with a cudgel and punish rogues and vagabonds with the bamboo it does not follow that china is not governed by tribunals that are a mutual check to each other or that is not an excellent form of government End of footnote let us not travel so far for examples while europe abounds with them no criminal is ever executed in england whose death warrant is unsigned by the king the same regulation prevails in germany and in most countries of the north of europe in france 
the same custom anciently existed and always ought to exist in every civilized nation cabal prejudice and ignorance may dictate sentences when they are not to be reviewed by the throne and little local intrigues are unknown to and disregarded by a court employed as it always is by objects of importance the supreme council of a state consists of men more accustomed to business and less liable to prejudice the habit of regarding great affairs only renders them less presuming because less ignorant and they are of course more capable of judging than the inferior judge of a province whether the whole state requires or not an example of severity in punishment in short whenever inferior courts have determined a case according to the strict letter of the law in interpretation often rigorous the supreme council mitigates the sentence in obedience to the dictates of general law which teaches us never to sacrifice our fellow-creatures but upon the most evident necessity End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter twelve of torture all mankind being exposed to the attempts of perfidy or violence detest crimes of which they may possibly be the victims all unite in the desire of punishing the principal offender and his accomplices but all nevertheless through a sentiment of pity which god has implanted in our hearts are roused to resist the practice of torturing the accused from whom a confession is wished to be extorted the law as yet has not judged them guilty and a punishment is inflicted upon them while we are in a state of uncertainty as to the crime they are supposed to have committed more terrible than the death awarded them when we are satisfied as to their guilt what i am ignorant whether thou art guilty or not and i must proceed to put thee to the torture in order to satisfy my doubts and if thou shouldst be innocent i will never recompense thee for the thousand deaths i have made thee suffer instead of the one which at the same time i was preparing for thee every being shudders at the thought i shall not here rely upon the fact that st augustine in his city of god has protested against the practice i will not say that the romans never tortured any but slaves and that quintilian recollecting that even slaves were men revolted at such barbarity if there were but one country in the world that had abolished the torture if there were as few crimes committed in that country as in any other if besides that country were more flourishing since the abolition the one example is sufficient for the rest of the world let england alone instruct other countries although she stands not alone in this good work the torture having been abolished with success in some other countries the question therefore is at rest shall not nations then who pique themselves on their politeness pride themselves also upon their humanity will they persist in an inhumane practice merely because it is the custom of the country reserve such cruelty if it be necessary to reserve it for those hardened villains who shall have assassinated the head of a family or the father of his country 
but do not suffer the blot of inflicting on a youth for trivial faults the same measure of punishment that you would decree to a patricide to remain on your country i am ashamed of having touched upon this subject after what has been said by the author of the essay on crimes and punishments i ought to have rested satisfied with wishing that mankind would often reperuse the work of that friend to humanity End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter thirteen of certain sanguinary tribunals will it be believed that there existed formerly a supreme tribunal more horrible than the inquisition and that that tribunal was established by charlemagne it was the judgment of westphalia otherwise called the vemic court the severity or rather the cruelty of this court was carried so far as to punish every saxon with death who broke his fast during the continuance of lent the same law was also established in flanders and franche comte in the beginning of the seventeenth century in the archives of a corner of the country called st claude situated among the most frightful rocks of the country of burgundy are preserved the proceedings sentence and account of the execution of a poor gentleman named claude guillon who was beheaded on the twenty eighth of july sixteen twenty nine reduced to great indigence and pressed by extreme hunger he ate on a fish day a morsel of horse flesh which he took from the animal which had been killed in a neighbouring field such was his crime he was condemned as a sacrilegious person if he had been rich and had spent two hundred crowns in procuring an extravagant fish supper while at the same time he suffered the poor around him to die with hunger he would have been looked upon as a man who fulfilled every duty the following is a copy of the sentence pronounced upon him having seen all the papers in this case and heard the opinions of doctors learned in the law we hereby declare the said claude guillon duly arraigned and convicted of having carried away part of the flesh of a horse killed in this town of having caused the said flesh to be cooked on saturday the third of march and of having eaten of the same etc what sort of doctors must those doctors of law have been who gave their opinions was it among the toppy numbers or among the hottentots that these transactions happened the vemic court was much more terrible commissaries secretly appointed by this tribunal spread themselves all over germany receiving accusations without the knowledge of the accused who were condemned without being heard and frequently when in want of an executioner the youngest of the judges performed the office and hanged the criminal himself it was necessary in order to be safe from the assassinations of this court to procure letters of exemptions and safe conducts from the emperors and these were sometimes ineffectual this court of murderers was not entirely broken up till the reign of maximilian i it should have been dissolved in the blood of its members the venetian council of ten was by comparison with this court a tribunal of mercy 
End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of the Commentary by Voltaire on an Essay on Crimes and Punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan Ingraham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Fourteen of the Difference Between Political and Natural Laws i call natural laws those which nature has dictated in all ages and to every people for the maintenance of the principles of that justice which nature notwithstanding all that has been said against it has implanted in our hearts theft violence homicide ingratitude to indulgent parents perjury committed to injure not to assist an innocent person and conspiracy against our native country are positive crimes everywhere more or less severely and always justly punished i call those political laws that are made to meet a present emergency whether for the purpose of strengthening the power of government or the prevention of future misfortune for example it is apprehended that the enemy may receive intelligence from the inhabitants of a city you shut the gates immediately and you forbid any one to pass the ramparts on pain of death or when a new sect in religion making a parade in public of its obedience to the sovereign power cabals in secret for the purpose of throwing off that obedience and under the pretext that it is better to obey god than man and that the reigning sect is loaded with superstition and ridiculous ceremonies wishes to destroy that which is deemed sacred by the state you enact the punishment of death against those who by dogmatizing publicly in favour of the sect run the risk of instigating the people to revolt or two ambitious men are disputing the possession of a throne the most powerful succeeds he punishes with death the partisans of his weaker antagonist judges become the instrument of the vengeance of the new sovereign and the supporters of his authority whoever had any communication under hugh capet with charles of lorrain ran the risk of his life unless he was very powerful when richard the third the murderer of his nephews was recognized as king of england a jury condemned sir william Collinburn to be quartered his crime was the having written to a friend of the earl of richmond who was at that time raising troops and who afterwards reigned under the name of henry the seventh two ridiculous lines of sir william's writing were found and they sufficed to consign him to a horrible death history abounds with similar examples of justice the law of retaliation is also one of those laws the authority of which is admitted by all nations the enemy has hanged one of your bravest officers who held out in a little ruined fort against a whole army one of their officers falls into your hands he may be an estimable man for whom you may have great regard yet you hang him upon the principle of retaliation you say it is the law that is to say because your enemy has sullied his character by one outrageous crime it becomes necessary for you to commit another all those laws the result of a sanguinary policy exist but for a time we easily see that they are not founded on principle when we observe them to be temporary 
they remind us of the necessity which in cases of extreme famine obliges men to eat each other they cease to devour men as soon as bread can be obtained End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter fifteen of the crime of high treason of titus oates and of the death of augustine de thou we call a blow aimed at the government of our country or against the sovereign who represents it high treason it is looked upon as a species of patricide and therefore the guilt of it ought not to be extended by law to offences which do not bear some analogy to that crime for if you consider a theft committed in a public building an act of extortion or even seditious words as high treason you at once lessen the horror which the crime of high treason properly so called ought to inspire in the ideas we form of great crimes there should be nothing arbitrary if a theft committed or an imprecation uttered against a father by a son be considered as patricide you break the bounds of filial love the son in future will never look upon his father but as an infuriated master everything overstrained in laws tends constantly to their destruction in crimes of ordinary occurrence the laws of england are favourable to the accused but in the case of high treason more than unfavourable the ex-jesuit titus oates being judicially examined by the house of commons and having declared upon his oath that he has told the whole truth subsequently accused the secretary of the duke of york afterwards james the second and many other persons of the crime of high treason and his declarations were received with attention he at first swore before the privy council that he had never seen the secretary and afterwards that he had seen him notwithstanding the informalities and contradiction accompanying this statement the secretary was executed this same titus oates and another witness swore that fifty jesuits had conspired to assassinate charles the second and that they had seen the commissions signed by father oliva general of the jesuits for the officers who were to command an army of rebels the testimony of those two men was considered as sufficient to authorize the tearing out of the hearts of several of those they accused and the dashing them afterwards in their faces but seriously speaking ought the testimony of two witnesses to be considered as sufficient to convict any man whom they have a mind to destroy at least one would suppose both ought not to be notorious villains neither ought the facts to which they swear to be beyond the bounds of possibility it is perfectly clear that if two of the most respectable magistrates of the kingdom were to accuse any individual of having conspired with the mufti for the purpose of circumcising the whole council of state the parliament the members of the court of exchequer the archbishop and the doctors of sorbonne it would be in vain for those two magistrates to swear that they had seen the letters of the mufti every one would suppose that they were both deranged and that no credit was to be attached to their declaration 
it was quite as extravagant to suppose that the general of the jesuits was raising an army in england as it would be to suppose that the mufti had sent over for the purpose of attempting to circumcise the court of france but unhappily titus oates was believed that there might remain no species of atrocious folly unthought of by the heart of man the laws of england do not consider persons as involved in the guilt of any conspiracy who may be privy to it and do not inform they consider an informer to be as infamous as the conspirator is guilty in france those who are privy to a conspiracy are liable to the punishment of death if they do not communicate their knowledge louis the eleventh against whom conspiracies were frequent made this terrible law which would never have been thought of by a louis the twelfth or a henry the fourth this law not only obliges a worthy man to turn informer and divulge a crime which by proper advice and firm conduct he might prevent but it exposes him likewise to be punished as a calumniator nothing being more easy than for conspirators to take measures to avoid conviction this was precisely the case of the truly respectable augustine de thou counsellor of state and the son of the only good historian of whom france can boast equal to guicciardini in understanding and perhaps superior in point of impartiality a conspiracy was formed rather against cardinal richelieu than against louis the thirteenth the object of the conspirators was not to betray france to an enemy for the principal author of the plot was the king's only brother who certainly did not design to destroy a kingdom to which he was the heir apparent there being between him and the throne no one but a dying brother and two children then in the cradle de thou was culpable neither in the sight of god nor man one of the agents of monsieur the king's only brother of the duc de bouillon sovereign prince of sedan and of the grand Ecurie de fia cinq mars had communicated verbally the plan of their conspiracy to de thou who went immediately to cinq mars and did his utmost to dissuade him from the enterprise if he then had informed against the conspiracy he would have been destitute of the means of establishing the truth of his allegation he would have been overwhelmed by the denials of the heir apparent of the crown of a sovereign prince and of the king's favourite as well as by the public execration he would have exposed himself to the fate of a vile calumniator the chancellor seguier even admitted the fact i am endeavouring to establish at the time de thou was confronted with the grand Ecury. it was during the confrontation that de thou addressing himself to cinq mars in the following words which are reported in a statement of the case said do you not remember sir that not a day passed over our heads that i did not mention that business to you for the purpose of dissuading you from it cinq mars acknowledged that it was true d thou deserved the thanks of his country rather than death such would have been the decision of the tribunal of human equity at least he deserved not death from cardinal richelieu but humanity was not richelieu's virtue in this particular case surely we may observe something stronger than summum jus summa injuria the sentence of death of this good man declares his crime to have been the having a knowledge of and a participation in the said conspiracies it does not state also because he did not inform 
hence it would appear that to discover that a crime is about to be committed is to be criminal and that one merits death sometimes for being in possession of eyes and ears the least we can say of such a sentence is that it was not dictated by justice but was the act of a few commissioners the letter of this murderous law was positive but i appeal not only to lawyers but to all mankind to say whether the spirit of the law was not perverted End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter sixteen of the revealing of crimes before commission by religious confession jorigny and balthazar girard who assassinated the prince of orange william the first the dominican jacques clement chatel raviac and all the other parasites of those days confessed themselves before the commission of their crimes fanaticism during that deplorable age was carried to such excess that confession was but the addition of an inducement to the perpetration of villainy crime became sacred because confession was a holy sacrament strada himself says that jorigny non ante facius agredi sustinuit quam expiatam nexis animam oput dominicanum jacerdotem celesti pane firma verit jorigny dared not undertake that action without having his soul purged by confession to a dominican friar fortified by the holy bread it appears from the answers to the interrogatories put to raviac that this wretch on quitting the order of the feuilletons and wishing to enter that of the jesuits addressed himself to the jesuit d'aubigny and after giving him an account of several visions that he had seen showed him a knife on the blade of which a heart and a cross were engraven and said to him this heart signifies that the heart of the king ought to be moved to make war upon the huguenots perhaps if d'aubigny had had zeal and prudence enough to have informed the king of those words and had described the man who uttered them the best of kings might have escaped assassination on the twentieth day of august sixteen ten three months after the death of henry the fourth while the hearts of all frenchmen were yet bleeding the attorney-general st servin of still illustrious memory moved that all jesuits should be required to sign the four following articles one that the council is superior to the pope two that the pope cannot deprive the king of any of his rights by excommunication three that ecclesiastics are as completely subject to the king as other persons four that any priest who is appraised by confession of the existence of a conspiracy against the king or state is bound to give notice of it to the civil magistrate on the twenty second of the same month the parliament published a decree forbidding jesuits to undertake the instruction of youth without signing the foregoing four articles but the court of rome was at that time so powerful and that of france so weak that the decree was entirely disregarded 
one fact is also worthy of remark while noticing the subject of confession which is that this very court of rome which when the life of a sovereign was in question was unwilling that confessors should divulge what was revealed in confession yet obliged them to reveal to the inquisition the names of those priests whom females should accuse in confession of having seduced or attempted to seduce them paul the fourth pius the fourth clement the eighth and gregory the fifteenth required such communications this was a very dangerous snare for confessors and their penitents it was turning a sacrament into a register of accusations and even required sacrilege for by the ancient canons particularly those of the lateran council held under innocent the third any priest divulging of confession of any nature whatsoever was liable to be degraded and imprisoned for life thus we find four different popes in the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries who order a sin of impurity to be divulged and yet do not permit the crime of parricide to be revealed a woman confessing herself to a carmelite friar acknowledges or feigns that a cordelier has seduced her the carmelite is bound to inform against the cordelier but let a fanatical assassin who believes he shall serve god by murdering his king consult his confessor upon this very case of conscience the confessor is guilty of sacrilege if he interpose to save the life of his sovereign this absurd yet horrible contradiction is one of the unhappy consequences of that continual opposition which has subsisted for so many ages between ecclesiastical and municipal laws the citizen found himself entangled on many occasions either in the crime of sacrilege or that of high treason and the distinctions of right and wrong were buried in a chaos from which they have not yet emerged the confession of sins has been authorized in every age by the practice of almost every nation the ancients accused themselves during the performance of the ministries of orpheus of isis of ceres and those of the island of samothracia the jews confessed their sins on the day of solemn expiation and continue the practice to this day a penitent selects his confessor who becomes a penitent in turn and each of them alternately receives thirty lashes with a whip while reciting the formula of confession consisting of thirteen words the sense of which consequently must be general none of these confessions were ever other than general and of course could never serve as pretexts for those secret consultations so often made use of by fanatical penitents for the purpose of sinning with impunity a pernicious corruption of a salutary institution confession the greatest check to crime became in times of confusion and licentiousness an incentive to wickedness and it is more than probable that for this reason so many christian communities have abolished a holy institution which could not but appear to them as dangerous as it was useful End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter seventeen of counterfeiting money the crime of counterfeiting the coin of a country is deemed and justly so high treason in the second degree 
to rob all the individuals of a state is to betray the state itself but the question may be asked whether a merchant who imports ingots from south america and converts them into good money be guilty of high treason and merit death in almost every country death is the punishment provided for this crime yet he has robbed no one on the contrary he has increased the circulation of specie and done the state a service but he has arrogated to himself the right of his sovereign he robs him in taking to himself the small profit that the king receives upon the coinage he has indeed coined good money but his example holds out a temptation to others to coin bad still death is a severe punishment for his crime i once knew a lawyer who wished such criminals as useful and ingenuous hands to be condemned to work in the royal mint with fetters on their legs End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare Bicaria, translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter eighteen of domestic theft in some countries a trifling domestic theft is punished with death is not i ask this disproportionate punishment as well dangerous to society as a temptation to commit larceny let a master prosecute his servant for a theft of a small amount upon the execution of the unhappy wretch society regards the master with horror they then feel that nature and such laws are at variance and consequently the law will be in future unexecuted what then is the result masters who are robbed unwilling to encounter public opprobrium content themselves with discharging a dishonest servant he steals from some one else and finally becomes familiar with iniquity the punishment of death being the consequence of a considerable robbery as well as of a trifling theft he will naturally steal to as great an amount as possible and at last will not hesitate at the commission of murder in order to escape detection but if the punishment is proportioned to the crime if the domestic guilty of theft be condemned to labour on the public works then a master would not hesitate about his conviction because the public feeling would not stand in his way and theft would be less frequent experience furnishes the lesson that rigorous laws are productive of crime End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter nineteen of suicide the celebrated du verger de Ron, abbot of saint cyran and generally considered as the founder of port royal wrote about the year sixteen o eight a treatise upon suicide now become one of the scarcest books in europe the decalogue says he orders us not to kill self-murder seems to be included in the precept as well as the murder of our neighbour therefore if situations occur in which it is lawful to kill our neighbour others may occur in which suicide becomes lawful no one ought however to attempt his own life 
without first consulting his reason public authority which represents god may dispose of our lives human reason being a ray of the eternal light may also represent the reason of god saint cyran extends this argument which after all is but a sophism to great length however i must confess that when he descends to particular instances in support of it he is not easily answered a man says he may kill himself for the service of his prince for the good of his country for the advantage of his family it does appear that we could with justice refuse our approbation to a codrus or a curtius what prince would dare to punish the family of a man who devoted himself for his service nay there is no sovereign who would dare to leave them unrewarded st thomas said the same thing before the time of st cyran but it is not necessary to have recourse to st thomas to st bonaventure to Oren, to feel that a man who dies for his country is entitled to our highest commendation st cyran concludes that that which is praiseworthy to do for others it is lawful to do to ourselves the arguments of plutarch of seneca and of montaigne on this subject are well known as are those of a hundred other philosophers who have written in favour of suicide the subject has been exhausted i do not here propose to defend an action which the law prohibits but neither the old nor the new testament forbid a man to shake off life when it becomes insupportable the roman laws did not forbid self-murder on the contrary a law of marcus antonius which was never repealed provides if your father or your brother unconvicted of any crime shall from pain through weariness of life in despair or from madness put an end to his life his will shall nevertheless be deemed valid or if he dies intestate his heirs inherit according to law notwithstanding that humane law of our ancient masters we draw upon a hurdle and pierce with a stake the body of the man who dies a voluntary death and at the same time we render his memory infamous we dishonour his family as far as lies in our power we punish the son because he has lost his father and the widow because she is deprived of her husband we even confiscate the property of the deceased which is in fact tearing from the living a patrimony which belongs to them this custom like many others is derived from our canon law which deprives of the rights of burial those who commit suicide the conclusion drawn from this fact is that no one can inherit on earth the property of a man who is deemed to have forfeited an inheritance in heaven the canon law under the head de penitentia assures us that judas committed a greater sin in hanging himself than when he betrayed our saviour end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter twenty of a certain species of mutilation we find in the digest a certain law of the emperor adrian which decrees death as the punishment of physicians who should make eunuchs either by castration or by bruising the testicles 
the possessions of those who procured themselves to be castrated were also confiscated by this law origen might have been punished under this law for having submitted to the operation in consequence of a too literal interpretation of the passage of st matthew there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven the face of things was changed under succeeding emperors who adopted the asiatic luxury particularly in the lower empire at constantinople eunuchs became patriarchs and even commanded the armies of the empire in our own times it is the custom at rome to castrate children in order to render them worthy of being musicians to the pope so that castrato and musico del papa now are synonymous not long since signs were to be seen at naples over the doors of certain barbers on which were written in large letters chi si castrano marvigliosamente i putti boys castrated here in the very best manner End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan in graham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter twenty one of the confiscation consequent upon all the crimes which have been mentioned it is a received maxim of the bar that he who forfeits life forfeits his effects a maxim in greatest rigour in countries where custom holds the place of principle thus as we have already remarked the children of those who voluntarily terminate their wretched days are doomed to perish with hunger as if they were the children of a murderer so that in every case an entire family is punished for the crime of an individual thus the father of a family having been sentenced to the galleys for life in an arbitrary manner either for having illegally harboured a preacher or having heard a sermon preached in a cavern or solitary place the wife and children are reduced to beggary that system of jurisprudence which consists in taking the bread out of the mouths of orphans and in giving to one man the property of another was unknown during the whole period of existence of the roman republic sylla first introduced it with his proscriptions and his example one would think ought scarcely to authorize the practice and indeed this system which seems to have been dictated by avarice and inhumanity was not enforced by caesar by trajan nor by the antonines whose names are still pronounced with respect by every civilized nation under justinian confiscation took place only in cases of high treason it would seem that during the times of feudal anarchy princes and feudal lords not being very rich endeavoured to augment their possessions by the conviction of their subjects and intended to furnish themselves with a revenue to arise out of crime law being with them entirely arbitrary and the roman jurisprudence unknown cruel and ridiculous customs prevailed but in modern times the power of kings is founded upon immense and certain revenues and their treasures do not require to be increased by the miserable remains of the fortune of an unfortunate family which are ceded generally speaking to the first one who requests them 
should one citizen be permitted to fatten on the blood of another in the provinces of france where the roman law is established confiscation does not exist except within the jurisdiction of the parliament of toulouse it does not prevail in some of the provinces where the customary or unwritten feudal law is in force as for example in the bourbonnais the provinces of berry maine poitou and bretagne or at least real estate is exempted it was established at calais formerly but the english abolished the custom when they were in possession of the place it is a surprising fact that the inhabitants of the capital live under a much more rigorous code of laws than the small cities so true it is that a system of jurisprudence is often established by fortuitous circumstances without regularity without uniformity like the cottages in a village who would believe that in the year sixteen seventy three that brilliant era of france the attorney-general omer talon would have expressed himself in full parliament on the subject of a young lady named cagnac in the following manner in the thirteenth of deuteronomy god says if thou comest into a city where idolatry reigneth thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword destroying it utterly and all that is therein and thou shouldst gather all the spoil thereof in the midst of the street and shalt burn with fire the city and all the spoil thereof for the lord thy god and it shall be an heap for ever and there shall cleave naught of the cursed thing unto thine hand in like manner in the crime of high treason the children were deprived of their inheritance which became forfeited to the king neboth being prosecuted quia maledixerat regi king ahab took possession of his effects david being informed that mephibosheth had rebelled gave all his possessions to ziba who brought him the news tua sint omnia que fuerunt mephi bosheth the question to be determined was who should inherit the paternal estate of mademoiselle de cagnac an estate formerly forfeited by her father ceded by the king to a lord of the treasury and by him granted to the tisatrix in this case relating solely to the possession of a native of auvergne a french attorney-general quoted the example of ahab king of a part of palestine who confiscated the vine of naboth after assassinating the owner with the sword of justice in action become even more proverbial for its turpitude and the application of which is intended to inspire mankind with a horror of usurpation surely the story of the vine of naboth bore no analogy to the question about the property of mademoiselle de cagnac the murder of mephibosheth the grandson of saul and son of jonathan the friend and protector of david and the confiscation of his goods had not the least affinity with the will of that lady with this sort of pedantry with this folly of quoting matters foreign to the subject with such ignorance of the first principles of human nature with such prejudices ill-conceived and worse applied has jurisprudence been commented on by men who have enjoyed reputation in their profession i leave it to my readers to supply reflections it would be superfluous to insert End of chapter twenty one
Chapter twenty two of the commentary by Voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by Cesare Beccaria, translated by Edward Duncan in Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter twenty two of criminal proceedings and of some other forms of procedure if it should ever happen in france that some of our too rigorous customs be softened by the laws of humanity without however affording greater facility to crime i am inclined to think that a reformation will take place in those proceedings in the enactment of which our legislators appear to have been influenced by too rigid a zeal our criminal law in many respects seems directed entirely to the destruction of the accused it is the only uniform system of law in the whole kingdom and it ought to be as terrible to the guilty as favourable to the innocent in england mere false imprisonment is a ground for recovering damages from the first minister of state if he orders it but in france an innocent man who has been immured in a dungeon who has undergone the torture has no consolation of that kind to hope for no one to look to for damages and he returns to society with a ruined reputation why because his joints have been dislocated that should excite pity and inspire respect the discovery of crimes it is said requires severity it is the war of human justice against iniquity but even in a state of war there is something like generosity and compassion the soldier is compassionate shall the lawgiver alone encourage the exercise of barbarity let us here compare the roman method of conducting criminal proceedings with our own with them the witnesses were publicly examined in the presence of the accused who had the privilege of cross-examining them either by himself or his counsel this method of proceeding was frank and noble it was full of roman magnanimity with us everything is transacted in secret a single judge attended only by his clerk hears all the witnesses who are examined separately this method established by francis i was confirmed by the commissioners appointed to arrange and modify the ordinances of louis the fourteenth in sixteen seventy its confirmation was owing to a mistake they took it into their heads in reading the code de testibus that the words testes intrare judicii secretum meant that witnesses were examined in private but secretum here means the judge's chamber intrare secretum if intended to signify private examination would not be latin a solecism was the foundation of this part of our jurisprudence the witnesses in criminal cases are generally the dregs of the populace whom the judge during private examination may make say whatever he pleases these witnesses are examined a second time but still privately and if upon their second examination they retract what they said during the first or vary in essential circumstances they are proceeded against for perjury so that when a simple but honest man unable to express himself with clearness but with every disposition to tell the truth recollecting that he has said too much or too little that he has misunderstood the judge or that the judge has misunderstood him retracts what he has said from a principle of justice he is punished as a villain he is forced to adhere to false testimony to avoid the consequences of perjury the accused if he flies 
exposes himself to certain conviction and this whether his crime be clearly proved or not some writers on jurisprudence indeed have maintained that contumacy ought not alone be a sufficient ground for conviction but that the charge ought to be fully proved but others less enlightened though perhaps more generally followed are of the contrary opinion they advance the doctrine that the flight of the accused is full proof of his crime that the contempt exhibited by him for justice in refusing to appear deserves the same degree of punishment that would follow a solemn conviction thus it depends upon the sect of lawyers to which the judge may happen to belong whether an innocent man be convicted or acquitted one other great abuse also prevalent in french jurisprudence is that the reveries and errors sometimes having the cruellest tendency of abandoned men who have undertaken to give publicity to their sentiments on legal matters are considered as law two ordinances during the reign of louis the fourteenth were promulgated which are in force throughout the kingdom in the first which relates entirely to civil proceedings the judges are forbidden to give judgment in a civil suit by default if the demand is not proved but in the second regulating criminal cases contains no provision that the accused if no evidence be produced against him shall be discharged extraordinary fact the law provides that he from whom a trifling sum of money is demanded shall not be adjudged to pay it without the debt is established but when life is in question it is a moot point whether he ought not to be convicted if contumacious although the crime be not proved suppose the accused withdraws himself from justice you proceed to seize and take an inventory of his property you do not even wait until the proceeding is finished you have as yet no evidence of his crime you do not know whether he is innocent or guilty and you commence proceedings by forcing upon the defendant immense unnecessary expense it is the penalty you say of his disobedience to the warrant issued against him but i ask is not the extreme rigour of your criminal practice the cause of his disobedience a man is accused of a crime you proceed to immure him immediately in a frightful dungeon you suffer no one to have communication with him he is loaded with fetters as if already convicted the witnesses who testify against him are examined in secret and in his absence he sees them only for a moment at the confrontation and then before he has heard their testimony he is bound immediately to state his objections to the witnesses and at the same time to name the witnesses in support of those objections and he has not the right to cross-examine them after the reading of their testimony if however he should convince the witnesses that they may have exaggerated some facts omitted others or have been mistaken in some of the particulars they have related the fear of punishment will induce them to persist in perjury and if circumstances admitted by the accused when interrogated be differently related by the witnesses that alone will be sufficient grounds for ignorant or prejudiced judges to condemn an innocent man what man is there that such a proceeding would not terrify where is the innocent man who can be sure of acquittal o oh, judges are you desirous that the accused should not fly furnish him with the means of defence the law seems to oblige the magistrate to conduct himself towards a prisoner rather as his enemy than as his judge this judge however 
possesses the power of confronting the accused with the witnesses or omitting it altogether why is so essential a thing as confrontation suffered to be optional the practice adopted however is in this respect contrary to a law which is equivocal there is always a confrontation but the judge does not always confront all the witnesses he omits often those whose statements appear to him to be unimportant such a witness though he say nothing against a man in the body of his testimony may upon confrontation testify in his favour the witnesses also may have forgotten circumstances favourable to the accused the judge at first may not have felt the weight of those circumstances and may not have reduced them to writing it is therefore extremely important that all the witnesses should be confronted with the accused and that such confrontation be not optional with the judge when it is a criminal charge the accused cannot have the benefit of counsel to defend him he flies a step to which every maxim of law incites him but he may be convicted in his absence whether the crime with which he is charged be proved or not strange doctrine if a civil suit to recover a sum of money be brought against a man a judgment by default cannot be obtained without proof of the debt yet if a matter involving his life occur he may be sentenced in his absence without a necessity for a shadow of evidence to substantiate his crime the law then holds money in more estimation than it does life o oh, ye judges consult the pious antonius and the good trajan they suffered not the absent to be condemned your laws allow an extortioner or a fraudulent bankrupt the benefit of counsel and very often deny it to one who may be an honest man if there can be shown one single case where innocence has been made to triumph through the exertions of an advocate the injustice of depriving any one of the advantage is manifest the president lamoignon said in speaking against this law that the advocate or counsel which it was the practice to assign to the accused was not a privilege granted by the ordinances nor by the laws of the kingdom it was a privilege derived from the law of nature a law more ancient than any human institution nature said he points out to every man the necessity of having recourse to the talents of others when he finds himself in a situation where they are indispensable to his safe guidance and he feels that he cannot conduct himself he seeks assistance when unable to defend himself with his own strength our ordinances have taken away from accused persons so many advantages that the least we can do in justice is to preserve those few that remain to them inviolate and most particularly the benefit of counsel and if our proceedings be compared with those of the romans and other nations it will be found that in no nation are they so rigorous as in france particularly since the ordinance of fifteen thirty nine the proceedings are still more rigorous since the ordinance of sixteen seventy they would have been much less so if all the commissioners had thought like m de lamoignon the parliament of toulouse has a singular decree of accuracy in weighing the testimony of witnesses in other places demi proofs are admitted which is at most admitting doubts there being no such thing as demi-truth but at toulouse they admit of quarters and eighth of a proof we may for example look upon hearsay as a quarter upon another hearsay more vague still as an eighth 
so that eight rumours which are but the echo of unfounded report may become a complete proof and upon such evidence as this it was that john calla was sentenced to the wheel the roman law required proofs to be luce meridiana clariores End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the commentary by voltaire on an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria translated by edward duncan ingraham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter twenty three the idea of a reform suggested the magistracy is in itself so respectable that the only country in the world where the office is venal sincerely desires a deliverance from the evil resulting from this custom they anxiously desire to see justice dispensed by the advocate who has contributed by his industry by his writings and by his eloquence to its defence and support perhaps we might then see a regular system of jurisprudence arise the result of enlightened exertions shall the same cause be forever decided one way in the provinces and another in the capital must the same man be always right in brittany and wrong in languedoc nay there are as many systems of jurisprudence as there are cities and in the same parliament the maxims of one chamber are not the maxims of another to show the astonishing contrariety of law in the same kingdom we have only to state that in paris a man who has been domiciled in the city a year and a day becomes a citizen in franche comte a free man who during a year and a day has inhabited a house held in montmain becomes a slave his collateral relations cannot inherit the property he may have acquired elsewhere and his children are deprived of their inheritance if they have been a year absent from the house in which their father died when limits are to be determined between the civil law and the ecclesiastical authority what endless disputes ensue who can point out those limits who can reconcile the eternal contradictions of the treasury and the bench in short why in certain countries do we find sentences which do not state the facts and reasons upon which they are grounded are they ashamed to avow their reasons for rendering judgment and why do not those who condemn in the name of their sovereign present their sentences of death for reconsideration to him before they are put in execution look around us where we will we find nothing but a confused scene of contradiction hardship uncertainty and arbitrary power thence arises our desire to render more perfect the laws upon which our lives and fortunes depend the end end of chapter twenty three end of an essay on crimes and punishments by cesare beccaria with a commentary by voltaire translated by edward duncan ingraham Recorded by Carolyn in 2014 in Groningen in the Netherlands. Thank you for listening.